told them if you yeah, shut us, they don't call it over no more. Okay, yeah. well, it's, it's, it's the kissing season. season. There's the man. I'll tell you what. I, uh, I'm a boyfriend now. So. <laughs> this was the first year that I had the stomach flu and the regular flu back to back. It was, it was yeah. unbelievable. And I they don't talk about mono anymore, anymore. or is that not a thing? I didn't have a when I was in high school, so. Yeah, that is good. You know, when you're ready, Mr. Davis. That's Mr. Good. Becker, we are live. All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone, uh, to, the, to tonight's meeting, our first meeting of today's activities meeting. Uh, I'll talk, turn it over to Mr. Barczyk and Mr. Inosti for the Winter Coaches Review. Okay, um, Winter Coaches are here. Myself, um, Cammy Trough, girls basketball, and Mike Whitefovich, boys basketball. Cammy, if you'd like to start, just give us an overview of your season. Um, any questions or concerns? Um, yeah, unfortunately, we had a rough season. We, uh, we don't want a game. Um, but we do play in one of the toughest uh, leagues in his six. And we lost four subs from last year. And the only three we decided that we had come back got hurt two games into the season. So she was out for the remainder of the season. Um, I don't have any, any concerns or uh, issues that came about during the season. Okay. Um, so three years ago, you played for a state final. Um, that was your first year, right? Yeah. And then this year, you know, you didn't have a win. How did how do you expect to get the program back to where? Um, well, three years ago on that team we had three one thousand point scores, so we lost a lot of scoring after last year, which and is always hard to replace, even if you have to replace one one thousand point scorer. Um, and from that team, there was six girls that went and played college sports, so it was a very athletic group of girls, um, and they were just overall uh, more basketball like. Common sense, they just had a better, um, I guess, eye for the game and things like that. Um, unfortunately, coming into the season, I had um, a whole summer schedule full of workouts where I had uh, not many girls show up, besides junior high girls. That would be some of the eighth grade girls. So the majority of the girls that showed up was my junior high. Um, we did have maybe occasionally three, maybe four girls show up to different ones for um, varsity, but... I mean, I went into games this year talking to some coaches. I'm good friends with some of the coaches that we played, and I asked them, like, hey, how many summer league games did you play this summer? And one coach was like, we played 40. Another coach was like, we played close to 50. And I couldn't play one because I couldn't get five girls to show up on the same time to play games. game. So um, it's hard to improve when girls don't come in the offseason. Like, that's the time to improve. That's the time to work on skills. And we were already behind all these other teams. Like I said, we're in a very strong league and district. So we were already behind all these powerhouses coming to the season because girls didn't do their part to work in the offseason. Um, since the season has ended, because since we didn't make playoffs, um, our season ended earlier than others, We ha I've already had three open gyms, and I've had two varsity girls show up to those open gyms. Um, I've had up to 10 um, seventh and 8th graders um, at least I've had at least 10, 7th, or 8th graders show up, and I've only had, like I said, a combined of two varsity girls. Um, and we even talked to the girls after the season, like, this is the time that we need to improve, like, you need to be showing up to stuff because that's what other teams do, and that's how other teams improve, and that's how other teams become good teams. So uh, we have a whole spring, uh, like this, this coming weekend and the following weekend, I'm taking 10 8th graders to two different tournaments because right now you can't take varsity level to things like that. So, um, like I said, it, I feel like we have a bright future because we have a very committed younger group coming up. Um, and then we do have girls that will show up, hopefully, um, for varsity-wise, but overall, they just weren't committed like they should have been. And we can't start working on skills when the season starts. That's the stuff that you work on before the season. And so, therefore, we just unfortunately didn't have girls committed. Um, you know, obviously, in the fall, it's hard to get girls to show up because we do have a lot of girls that do play soccer, and we have... I think we had one girl play hockey, but I did have open gyms, and even with those open gyms, with the girls that were remaining, I only had like one or two girls show up for open gyms as well. So, like I said, we have a lot um, scheduled for the summer. Um, we're going to camp at Cookstown University in July. Um, I'll continue to have open gyms twice a week, 
and I will definitely be able to schedule some summer league games um, throughout the summer with the girls that I know who already have been committing um, after the season already. So I don't know. It's just really hard to compare both teams because I had girls that were playing varsity level that weren't ready to play varsity, and I didn't have a choice because we didn't have the numbers. So. Do you have anything, Mr. Um, no, we're good. Okay. Um, Coach Mike Whitovich, um, thigh still hurts from Saturday. I feel your pain too. Yeah. You know, so if you just want to talk about the season, um, uh, just so everybody knows, and then um, you know, if you have any questions or or concerns about sure. any equipment or facilities or anything like that. <laughs> um, team wise, we finished 16 and six in the regular season which qualified us for the District 4 AAA playoffs, um, which we came out with a third place medal in District uh, 4 AAA, which advanced us to state playoffs. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we had a tough loss on Saturday out in Forest Hills. Uh, kids kids played hard. The ride was ride was a long, uh, and I, but they once they they uh, got down early, but they they did not give up. It's indicative of what they've done all, all year, as far as you know, never quitting and stuff like that. So we fought back, came down to the wire. We just fell a little bit short, but um, we finished the year eighteen and eight. Um, and you know that's four extra games, you know, playoff games that we played, which I mean doesn't sound like a lot, but when you break it down, you play a twenty-two game regular season and you play four playoff games. It's you know just about a quarter of a season extra game time that you that we got in. So, I mean, that does wonders for the younger kids, the freshmen, sophomores, the juniors that are coming back, the extra practice time, extra game experience. So, uh, as far as the, you know, the future, um, we, we play a mixture of freshmen, sophomores, juniors this year. So, uh, I feel fully that, you know, we'll be in, you know, in position to compete, you know, for district playoff, district championship, state playoff efforts you know, in the years to come, for sure. Um, as far as, uh, uh, individual accolades go uh, with some team success. You know, fortunately comes the, some individual success. Uh, Brian Britton was named the PHAC Division Three Player of the Year or most valuable player. Uh, that's his second time in a row last year and this year, which is quite an accomplishment. Uh, in my recent memory, I can't remember anyone that has been named back-to-back -back, you know Player of the Year like that. So he had a great career, uh, dedicated his you know, his life to it. So it's good to see the work you know pay off. You know, he was all, you know, I told him to go to get, you know, he was always reaching out to me and he put extra work in and I was always let him in whenever I could. So it's good to see that. He did score a thousand point earlier this year uh, at Shemokin at the beginning of the season. And then he ended up, I didn't do the total numbers yet, but he probably ended up with about 1,500 points and he scored a thousand in December. So he had, had quite a season. Um, so he was named the most valuable player. Isaac Carter and Jacob Coy were named to the second team, uh, PHAC All Star team. Uh, and Dominic Federoff was uh, named to the uh, all defensive team. So we had four guys get some individual recognition, uh, which is always, which always good. That gives the other kids something to build off of and look up to. Um, so as far as the whole, I, I think we're in a good spot, uh, both with what we did this year and what we had coming back. And we really worked hard from when I got here just a few years ago on, you know, kind of building a, a culture, you know, a, a culture of winning, obviously, but. You know, that starts with behavior and doing things the right way. And they've done that, you know, without question the last few years. And I, with that, if you do things the right way and behave and, and work hard, the winning will come. And I, I think that's what's paying off. So uh, the seniors were great leaders as far as that goes, but the, the underclassmen that have been part of this for the last two, three years see it. So I think we have a you know good thing going as far as the you know, team overall. Any questions or concerns about anything? No, nope, I have no issue with the facilities. Um, I think it's great. I mean, we, I mean, I think it's great. Well, we have the the main gym has the eight rims, which I finally learned how to hit the button. and They do it automatically <laughs> now for you, so I don't have to stand there the whole time. But uh, thanks to Coach Myers for teaching me that little trick. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, with having eight eight rims in the gym, like you can always keep kids busy doing stuff on the side, and you know, so we've taken advantage of that. And then with having the the old gym or an elementary gym or you know, I guess it's considered the old gym right down the hallway. Um, you know, if you need to move move from one to the other, it makes it very convenient. So as far as you know facilities go or anything like that, I have no issues. Questions. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Any any concerns about facilities? Any problems with game with the gyms? Anything 
No. No. Okay. All right. I'll start with uh, the wrestling. Um, this season, we had an 11 and 5 team dual meet record. Um, we qualified for team districts. Um, we uh, came up a little short there, but we had a very solid team year. Um, moving on to individuals, we qualified seven for the District 4 tournament. We had five district medalists and one district champ. Um, and then the following week, we qualified five for the North East Regional Tournament. Had two regional medalists and one regional champ. Um, we qualified two for the PIAA State Championships, um, which were just this weekend. Um, we ended up with two state runner-ups in Mason Barbitsky and Garrett Garcia. Um, this was both of the young men's highest place finish at the state tournament. Um, as far as the team at the state tournament, we finished in 10th place. Um, we are the second highest team in the state in District 4 to place. Um, Garrett Garcia is a two-time state medalist for Southern Columbia, and Mason Barbitsky is one of just, I believe, is two others that have been a four-time state medalist at Southern Columbia. Um, Garrett Garcia, he'll make his decision soon on which college he'll wrestle for. Um, I was told that he's going to go wrestle and not play football. Mm -hmm. Um, Mason Barbitsky, um, this will kind of get into our third point up there a little bit. Mason Barbitsky will attend Army West Point to wrestle and further his education and serve his country for the next nine years. Now, I'm not saying Mason wouldn't have had the opportunity to attend West Point on his own, but wrestling is a huge reason he got accepted. Um, athletics are a huge reason these young men will go on to further their education and I'm 100% positive they'll make a difference in this world. Um, as far as the future goes, we have lots of freshmen coming up. We'll be able to fill the lineup and have some depth moving forward. Very young team will only have one senior next year. Um, so it'll be freshmen and junior pretty stacked that way. So things look right. So um, Coach Fulmer sent the message out Sunday, the day after the state tournament, with the uh, off-season workouts, um, which are starting tomorrow. So we'll continue that and we'll do our preseason workout in August like we did this year. And that was a huge uh, help to get guys in shape and ready for the season. That's all I have. Yeah. Um, thank you all for uh, your hard work and dedication this year. Uh, a couple other items I want to mention um, that are coming up very quick. Um, for our musical, our let's call it the Little Shop of Horrors, uh, will be taking place in the high school auditorium uh, for March 14th through the 16th, and the following the week of March 18th, um, we are going to do an elective showcase where our teachers um, that teach elective courses are going to promote their classes in an assembly. Uh, presentation type format to promote their classes to our student body so our, all of our students um, know what each teacher has to offer in their particular elective course so they can make informed decisions for their futures. Um, those are the two big things coming up. Um, there's more to be discussed next week but that is enough tonight for the uh, activities uh, meeting report. Okay, two other things I know wanted to be discussed was the invent Emission discussion uh, got brought up. Express and I think you uh, talked to Steve and Henry about this. Just kind of wanted to review what we what we're doing now. Um, this was board approved, I think, two, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, we're charging for each each event. The, that was the that was approved uh, actually for the 22 23 school year. So uh, July 18th of 2022. We did those last year and approved them at different amounts, didn't it? The only change was the uh, student math. Okay. Was cool. So is this up for discussion again as to what we're going to do for next year? 
Well, yeah. Well, I, th I think Cindy, if you if you don't mind me, we're talking no, about you're, you're we're right. talking about softball especially, yeah. and and we don't charge for baseball. Um, we do charge for softball, and just historically, just give you a historical perspective of why that happened. It was all when we decided to charge for sports years ago. Um, it was all about how we could funnel fans in. And if we could funnel, then we would charge. Uh, there was even look. So baseball was the only thing we didn't charge for. Um, so we started looking at ways to charge for baseball. And it was just it was almost impossible the way the baseball fields set up and the people who come for any direction. There was no funnel. And to make a funnel, it would cost us. And I was talk about one time talk about fencing the whole base field, baseball field in putting a, a fence screen in so you couldn't see through the fence and you'd have to come in. That would have was cost prohibitive to do all that stuff. So it was just, uh, so baseball wasn't on the list. That's where if you see, you see the NA for baseball, uh, that's why that was not chosen. Uh, but all the other sports being charged for. Um, so Cindy, if I'm right, you were you were questioning why don't we charge for baseball but charge for softball? Yeah. Is that am I correct? And because right, this is second game I've heard from Henry and I know you talked to Henry Mike. Yeah. So I thought yeah. this was important to bring this up. Henry and Steve and I had talked about it and I said I just don't I don't we kind of all agree that charging for softball, it, it's minimal attendance. I don't know if we even get enough revenue to pay ticket takers. Like, so we kind of all thought that if we could not charge for softball, and that's why I reached out to you. Like, I don't know, is it a board vote? Can we all? Just decide we're not going to charge for softball. I don't. Uh, I would think since the board approved, I think the board would have to amend. Just, just one question I have on this given too. Do any of these use predominantly? No, I was like, go ahead. Predominantly the lower field yet for games like field hockey, soccer. Soccer is the outdoor field. Very few. So there's, there's games down, down all right. The only, the only reason I asked that was just because when you're talking about the cattle shooting and the costs and all of that, if field hockey is playing all of their games in that lower field, I would say that I would say like, why would we charge for that too? Kind of a similar thing, like an open walkthrough concept versus you're coming through a gate into a facility. So, so the, the lower facility in years past, when we even before we had turned into charging, there was a little uh. Right. Stand down there, and we got the cars as they were pulling in. So we played. We have played one field hockey game down there in the last two seasons, varsity wise. And there was an issue. And the only reason there was an issue with the turf way that event. Right. So there's a couple soccer games moved down there two seasons ago, but this last season nothing was played down. Mainly there. practice field of the practice. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that it didn't become like a thing of well, if the reason you're not charging them is basically because it's a, a pass through to get to the game what makes that lower field so different other than you cattle shoot the driveway right but if no games really being played down there anyway it's, it's a non-starter argument for the couple times that they come up yeah so uh, I, I don't have an issue. Kendall Drew Jim anybody have an issue with not charging for softball Jim Becker what do you think you good with it no, I'm uh -oh. working on running report. Uh oh. <laughs> but I'm slow. <laughs> this is Jim's laptop. But I'm yes, I not... see the finance guy with his finger up. Well, I was like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> why don't we know how much money we make? And so it's still loaded. But I mean, here's the thing you're, you're absolutely correct. It's not a large revenue generator. So, you know, it's not a big deal. But I always like when we use numbers. <laughs> well, and I guess another Strictly thing, too, so. is if this is going to come back onto a board vote thing where you're looking to put this on for next week because of it adjusting for the season to start, do we just amend it for also next 
school year in general at one point or in one shot, or are we going to put this back on the agenda for June or July to revote on it for next calendar years? Well, I think the only time we we would put it on to amend is if there was a change. Well, that's like we changed with the, the students. This, this, this is well, this is what I'm asking because the whole topic of making it free for kids at this point is that we're going to amend this now, and we were looking we're talking about doing that for next school year anyway. Right. We just do the amendment all at one. That so next year when sports pick back up on that aspect of it, it's it's just done, and we're not forgetting and revoting on it and dealing with refunding and all this other stuff if that's or does Chris wanna so 3258 is um softball I, just, I couldn't remember the number it was 32 something actually he might have been able to get it better than me <laughs> um does hometown ticketing separate adults and students or children yes Yes, absolutely. Now the trick for us though. So do we want Chris to get the So the first game is the twenty first of March. So will you guys have time? No. Mm -hmm. Other not like a... Just other not yeah. It's only really a board meeting next week, so we'd have right. to any decision we have to well, well, instead of amending this twice in a year once there's been a topic, might as well just do a one in one shot and jump with it because But do we want to find out what I'm gonna go with I don't really care but you're in charge, so <laughs> I'm just saying to cover all our bases. Do you think we should find out so that we can say a number? No, the trick here, yeah, here's a difficulty like, yeah. with hometown you ticket issue. Uh, for everybody, so it doesn't matter. Oh, the other one. The other one. The beautiful. So the trick is in the fall, right? So I'm a student. I pay fifteen dollars for the pass. So then we attribute that to all all year long purchase passes. So we really don't. Once you buy that pass, that fifteen dollar revenue is is kind of permanent. You know what I mean? So I can't. Now we can run the report that we can say how many students entered last year, but to come up with a dollar amount from hometown ticketing is difficult only because those funds were already received. And again, you know, from my point of view, the purpose of hometown ticketing is security and knowledge of who's entering our facilities. It also helps us with cash management. It helps us with security and those kind of things, both physical and funds. Well, just right. because it's no cost to the student to have the pass doesn't mean they still don't have to go in and register and put in their thing to get it though right it's just yeah that, no they'll be able right. to do that well they would have to like oh yeah yeah now. yeah, yeah not, that, that, that's a beautiful piece that my point is like if i ran a revenue report since we've gone to hometown ticketing you'll see my you'll be like oh my gosh nobody comes to a softball game but the answer is they already bought it season pass in the fall there, yeah the there's people that buy all sports passes at the beginning of the year or if they want spring they just go ahead and do it you know right. what i mean so right well, when I see the revenue streams, there's very few. I think in the past month, there was only two all season passes purchased. Yeah. That was it because the people that wanted them they were wise. Them. They got them earlier in the year, they've got better value out of them. And here's the thing remember, at the end of the day, my goal here is for people to come to our games. Right. That's what I want. I want to settle people in the seats, um, hopefully buying some of the concessions, cheering on the Tigers for all sports, fall, winter, and spring. So, anyways, I think that's a big piece of it is, you know, well, if the parents don't have to pay for their three students now to get in at all, it's fantastic. It's more than likely that they'll come back. And, yeah. And and it's like Drew asked, it's not trying to promote it to every student across all schools to get in for free. This is the Southern students, of course. Of course. So our kids. Correct. Yeah. So uh, I'm just having trouble running this report, and I and I think I recognize why. But in general, if the discussion is to take the student passes to zero, which I believe we investigated with hometown thinking they had no problem as long as we we're still charging for adults. Yes, so they're not making any money then. Right. 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 And they're trying to make money, don't blame them. That's their service, right? They're getting up heat. Well, they still get other school students. Absolutely. External. Yep. External passes would still be required for the other kiddos. And uh, yeah, so there's, you know. Jim, Kendall, thought, any thoughts on making students free? I think it's a great idea, and I agree with the. If you don't charge for baseball, you shouldn't charge for softball. Agree. Okay. Her ear still doesn't work. <laughs> Just so you know, Kendall, you got to talk louder. Her ear still doesn't work. That's <laughs> my ear. I should have sat closer. <laughs> <laughs> 
At home, it's the kids. Here, it's Justin. What did he say? He's, so he's, he's good with softball being free kids. I guess that just has to be voted on by you guys. Yeah. At the meeting next Monday. Mr. Becker, students free? Give me a recommendation. We're gonna, we'll, we'll set it up and uh, we'll go from there. Now, do you want to do students free? Now? Yeah. Now, now, knowing other people have already bought passes. Right, so that's one thing I was considering. Well, was. the thing is, I, I guess where I was at was if we just, and, and those numbers are still wrong, though, because actually the last one we approved in 22-23 was season passes 140. You may be right. Fall is 50, winter 75, and spring is 40. Yeah. But, and. And students were 15, right? Well, I think Bill chose 25 on that, but I think we were down to 15 or 750 or something of that nature. Yeah, so, they call it 250 out the door. Right, so. I would, I mean, I would still just say if you want to garner thoughts from everybody else, yes, I, I would think that I'd like to see the students free. And what would it matter if we approve it now or not? It's just from this point moving forward, this is the change that needs to be made. That's true. Unless somebody they're wants to remember in June and be the responsible party for this, to say in June we're going to pull this back out and revote on it for this purpose. Like, do, do uh, so, and I'm just kidding for not so the student pass, do they actually have a physical pass, or is it on the phone? It's on the phone. Yeah, it's on the And they still have to go on to hometown ticketing. They still go through. They put in their number, probably provide them just no balance, check out, zero dollars. And yeah. it, when they, they put in their student code, it's like zero dollars. So, so they what, what happens to like a, a younger child who doesn't have full? Well, I have my kids screenshot yeah. and in my Apple wallet. I have my daughters on here. Because I screenshot them and my wife and they're in my Apple yeah. wallet. Okay. Same thing the parents are doing already now. I mean, it's just, yeah. if now, I mean, on a Friday night, it's just as likely parents don't want to drag their kids out to a football game just because of the hassle of it. Well, the kids are free now and they're saying, hey, mom and dad, there's no reason not to take me. I don't cost anything. Well, now mom and dad have to buy tickets. So. Our goal is to get people in our stands and in our stadiums and our student passes. So what we'll do is we'll put an amendment on or an agenda item. Student passes free, softball, no charge. I'll amend this. Not this, but more recently. I'm sorry. I pulled up the wrong one. Okay. So, okay. Sergeant, we'll have to pull the softball concept off of it. When you make those games, you won't have to make the softball. Well, I think about that, though. Well, well, are you, I don't you have any ticket takers in anymore then for softball? Is that how that works? Then? Well, yeah. you just need the game manager and security. Okay. So then we would remove those from the uh, the lineup because people shouldn't. Now we need them for the external people. Or no, no, I can charge for external either, right? We're not going to charge for softball. We're not charging anyway. for softball at all. For external people right. for our people. Yeah. Right. Is that correct? Okay. So if the change is made, I'll just contact hometown and tell them to pull all the softball. Off of there, because they already have our schedule. I, I thought so. Yeah, that's yeah. why I was bringing it up. Yeah. Yeah. And even if we're not charging for students, they still have to register. So the security piece mm -hmm. of it is still yeah. right in place. Okay. And we'll, we've we Steve and I definitely spoke with the company about oh that. Oh, yeah. I don't remember the particulars, but I know they said possible as long as we continue selling adult tickets. Yeah. There was a cap yeah. out there. So we'll just have to push it in the school student passes. You still have to go through hometown. So we'll just have to get that out of there. Instead of, you know, a bunch of kids just showing up, it's free. I don't need nothing. Well, you know, you at least need a student pass. An entry pass. So right. Just a free entry pass. A free, yes. From home to And our ticket takers scan the free pass. Yeah. Okay. For yeah, I mean. Understanding that. You know, yeah, yeah, we should do that as well. Well, that way we have the register that, you know, Susie was here at 5 o'clock and Johnny was here at 530. Right. I think that's helpful to the principals and, and to the administration. Yeah. I mean, if they have a way to, if, if you ask them, if they have a way to make that retro that it didn't apply till after the season is officially end, but it has to apply immediately and so be it. Okay. Yeah. I'll so make that you can get that out. Yeah. The Friday left. Okay. Uh, as I said in an email to the board, uh, Mr. McMahon and I were having a discussion uh, about two weeks ago, maybe longer. You still want the coaches uh, to stick around, or are they free if they want to leave? Yeah, I think you guys are good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, you. guys, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. So we were talking about uh, athletics, but extracurricular activities, and you know, the importance of extracurricular activities um, in, in 
in compared to the, the price that we pay or the, the amount that we pay for um, athletics in our budget. So as, as we were talking, um, it wasn't so much that Mr. LeVan disagreed with everything. He was just, as we were talking, I was going through some of the topics that actually we'll discuss here. And uh, he was saying, you know, this may maybe be a good thing to share publicly, which I agreed with him right away, just because we do have people out there who um, might not know the importance of athletics. I mean, he's sitting around here. We have some people that were athletes and some people that weren't. And, uh, you know, so we, and just like our public, we have people out there that were athletes and some that weren't and, uh, or were not. And, uh, so just put some little information out there. So I just put together about 10 little items, uh, shared it with Steve and and uh, and Henry, and just came up with some just discussion points um, at why high school athletics. And now I say athletics, this could transfer over to anything extracurricular. Um, you know, we do our uh, musical is, uh, if you walk down to the auditorium right now, they're, they're getting ready for their show which starts Thursday night. So if you didn't get your tickets, get online or website and get your tickets to uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, kind of peeked in the other day and uh, I'm excited to uh, see the show. Um, but so any extracurricular, um, there's a number of things. So especially with athletics, you have physical health, um, you know, being, being part of uh, an athletics team improves your physical health. Uh, participation, as I said, encourages regular physical activity, which is essential, essential for meaningful good health and preventing obesity and other health issues. Uh, second thing is teamwork, cooperation. If you, if, and you know, a lot of us are um, professionals, or um, very few times do we do, and I'll just talk about myself, although I'm the superintendent, very few times do I work alone. Um, tonight's, a, for instance, we're sitting here as a group working through things as a team. Um, almost everyone's job as co-workers that are part of the team. So you do, you know, if you go into the, you know, any kind of field, let's just say the medical field, I know there's a, a you know, if you're a doctor, a nurse, or a surgical, there's surgical teams, right? There's, there's medical teams. There's teams on uh, uh, you know, construction sites. There's, there's uh, teams in our building. We have team leaders and. So, you know, athletics, extracurriculars, you know, uh, afford athletes or students to work together as a team, cooperation, or cooperating towards a common goal. This fosters important like, skills like communication, leadership, and collaboration, which are valuable in both personal and professional growth, professional life. Uh, discipline, um, than anything you're involved with, uh, as athletics and extracurriculars enhances discipline, time management, balancing academics, what sports requires discipline, time management skills. Athletes also often must juggle practice games and schoolwork, uh, teaching how to prioritize tasks and manage their time effectively. Uh, one of the things we're talking in the PHAC meetings is we're trying to uh, limit travel time. So we're looking at realigning leagues and in the future, um, and one of its travel time Again, get kids home earlier, but as you can see, time management is important. Um, character building, and believe me, we do have some characters walking the halls here. Uh, some adult characters, but some student characters as well. But character, we're talking about um, high school athletes teach, athletics teach important values such as sportsmanship, perseverance, perseverance resilience, determination, determination. Athletes learn how to handle both success and failure with grace, which helps build strong character. Social skills, sports provide an opportunity for students to interact with peers from diverse backgrounds, fostering friendships and social connections. This can help shy, introverted students who come out of their shell and develop confidence in social situations. Uh, healthy competition, um, competition is a good thing. Um, to an extent, healthy competition teaches athletes how to set and strive for goals, 
push themselves to improve and handle pressure in a constructive way. It also teaches them how to win and lose graciously. Personal development. Through sports, students develop a sense of identity, identity and self-confidence. They learn to trust their abilities, set realistic goals, and push themselves beyond their comfort zones. Academic performance. We see that here. Uh, research has shown that students who participate in sports, and again, this is any extracurricular activity, not just sport, but I'm just, we're focusing on sports here tonight, uh, have a better academic performance. This is often attributes to the discipline and time management skills they acquire through athletics. One of the things that, you know, you go to our athletic banquets or end-of-year celebrations, you know, the scholar-athlete is recognized, and boy, more, more of our team you can pick any team, but there's more on our team that are teams that are scholar athletes as compared to non scholarship athletes. Um, and our coaches really push that. Our coaches push, you know, academics. Attendance rates. This is absolutely true. I've been a high school principal for a long time. When students are involved in athletics, um, their attendance rates are better. I would see, I, I just look back at myself back in school in the 80s. I didn't miss a day during the fall. I didn't miss a day during the winter. And come the spring, there were a few times I had the yeah. trout flu and the turkey cold. <laughs> so, um, you know, I did miss some time then, but it was I wasn't involved in a spring sport. So, um, you know, being accountable to be in attendance so I could participate in my practice in my games. Um, Involvement in the school community. Our coaches do such a good job of getting our kids out beyond the practice and game field, um, volunteering in the community, helping youth. And, and sometimes, like I want to just recently, I saw some photos that, uh, you know, Mike, our basketball coach, had our basketball team over at the McDonald's house, uh, Ronald McDonald House in Danville. Um, and I know all of our sports teams do a lot of things help with in our community. Um, talking about college opportunities. Um, and again, this is the last thing I have where we can kind of discuss this a little further. Uh, for, talent, uh, for talented athletes, and when I say talented athletes, it's not easy to get a scholarship. Even some of our talented athletes don't get a scholarship or what we think about um, as a scholarship where you're getting a whole um, tuition paid, or even part of tuition paid. Um, that's that's a difficult thing to, to get. Um, more than that, more than more than a scholarship, high school sports can open doors for colleges, or through scholarships, but beyond scholarships, athletes can get offered opportunities for acceptance and admission into colleges, universities, or other institutions of higher education who may not have been afforded the same opportunity without these athletics. Um, I, I, you know, as a as a col as a high school coach, I had many students that um, got into colleges because they had the athletic background. Um, into uh, had doors open for them because um, of what they did in high school athletics. Um, may may have not got that full ride, but had the opportunity to go to the college of their choice. Um, like Mr. Barbitsky. A uh, perfect example. What he've gotten in the West Point, maybe he's a great student. He's yeah. a great kid, a good character. Um, Best one help him though. Being second in the state, four-time state medalist, I'm sure that ha that helped get him in. Because when you're trying to get into a, a pre prestigious university such as you know West Point, it's it's splitting hairs between the kids that get in and the kids that don't. So you offer any opportunity you can help to get you into that conversation of being accepted. Um, that's what more of our kids that happens to than our kids that get the full scholarship. Um, and again, overall, high school athletics play a crucial role in shaping well-rounded individuals, preparing them for success both on and off the field. Southern Columbia has many examples of successful students after high school Many of those can point towards their athletics as being an integral reason for that success. Um, and that's that's kind of a, that was almost an editorial 
paragraph on my part, how I feel. Now, again, athletics was a big part in my life. Um, and, you know, I was able to go to college on a partial scholarship. But, it, you know, I think being a high school athlete and a college athlete, it kind of it pushed me. All these things that I mentioned, the 11 things, you know, were part of that um, making me successful and not giving up in times that were tough. And uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great proponent of not only athletics, but extracurriculars, being involved. Anybody want to add a question or anything? So the reason I brought this up to Jim in the conversation, <clears throat> of course, the budget's coming up, being the winter board, to the questions that are going to come, why is the budget so high? Why is the sports budget so high? Example of the huddle filming. That's being questioned. So I asked Jim, as far as the sports budget, we'll say $500,000, are the kids benefiting after leaving high school, getting into colleges, scholarships, or whatever? And then we got into the conversation of it opens a lot of doors, maybe not so much scholarship, but it opens up a lot of doors for them to get. So that gave me an answer that if anybody asked me about the budget, the sports budget, whatever, I could say, hey, now look, here's what happens with the sports for the kids that are going to college. This is what they can get out of it. And then the other thing, we talked a little bit about the huddle. At that point, I have no problem with the district paying that remaining $5,000. Because as Jim said, their schools look at those videos of how the kids play, how they interact, whatever, which helps them to get into some of the, you want to say, prestigious schools. So I'm glad that he put this all down. And that way it gives me, and maybe Kendall, uh, a way to explain to our taxpayers that, hey, this isn't a waste. This is what's happening. It's justified because the kids get a lot more out of it than just that five hundred thousand dollars. I have two other th uh, things. You know, um, I think it's a benefit also for student mental health. Um, let's face it. I mean, kids, especially middle school kids, high school kids, got a lot going on in their personal life. Um, Playing sports could be their release um, to release some aggression instead of taking it out on other things that could inhibit their life from a negative standpoint. I know with football, but I was frustrated. I couldn't wait to go out and, and hit somebody. You know that was uh, that was my release um, playing in fo playing football. And I know a lot of kids feel the same way. And you know also, you know being a principal, Mr. Becker, you were you know former principal. Um, I find that. It, uh, it lowers incidence of discipline in the school because it deters kids from getting in trouble because if they're suspended or if they have a detention, they're not going to practice and they're not playing in the game if they're suspended for that game. So I think there's two extra benefits there also. You know. That's a good point. I had one of my wrestlers um, just a few weeks ago was in some type of argument in a classroom with another student and he was ready to, he told me this at practice, he was ready to lose it. But the, it popped in his head, what would Coach Pizarchik say? I can't do this. Just call me down. You know, so it does. I think it's also important for everybody to understand that these students are held to uh, a certain grade point average as well. You know, and if they don't have the grades, they don't play the sports, they're not favored in that way um, and I think it encourages kids just the way it does with behavior yeah. you know, to yeah. keep their grades up yeah I mean I think this whole winter we had one student academically ineligible oh, I don't think there was any middle school ones Mr. Kiefer I can't remember any and I'll make point to that I know it was brought up because I questioned it within the athletic handbook that our actual requirements are even more strict than PIAA's yes. in terms of of this so academics are always going to be first and what even allows these kids to be on the field 
you know, like you said, all of our coaches do monitor. I, we get a weekly, report weekly from the weekly report. Yeah. No questions or discussion on this? Mr. Davis, do we have any public comment? Mr. Davis, do we have a public comment? Uh, Mr. Becker, let me check. There are no public comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Davis. Are we going to pause or are we staying live? Pause and start facilities and finance at 7 p.m. All right, so that's a yes, that is a pause. Pause, yes. I'll let you know when we're off air. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Here, for being what you can have in the store. I'll bring them in there. Thanks for the photo. I laughed when I finished. Mr. Becker, we are live. Thank you. After our good evening again, welcome back to our facilities and finance meeting. We're going to uh, jump around here a little bit, if everyone doesn't mind. Uh, we do have some visitors, um, Tony Lilo and uh, Curtis Funkhauser from Columbia Montorgo Tech to talk about their proposed budget. I'll we'll turn it over to Betty Lankin. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us out. On behalf of Columbia Montorgo BTS, we appreciate uh, you having us out. And just want to, I'm not going to steal Tony's thunder on this, just give you a little bit of an overview of uh, our budget and where we stand with things. and answer any questions so I mean, yeah okay Jim yeah Jim if you could bring up that PowerPoint there that's perfect so first of all I just wanted to, to tell everybody a little bit about how the the renovation project has gone and uh, how pleased we are with it and you know, thank everybody for your support Southern's always really supportive of us and uh, if you get a chance come out and see the, the building it looks great um, we still need to add some character do some things to it um, we have uh, some money available to get some new furniture for the building, things like that. Because right now we have uh, recent desks from the 1970s and in brand new plasters. But but so so things like that. We were looking at your chairs here just a minute ago because we need some some new chairs like that for the. the Did you bring the truck? The building's just about done. We have I, three more. Yeah programs to renovate this upcoming summer, uh, machine tech, uh, carpentry and building trades. But once those are done, everything should be complete. Um, and that means that pretty much all the payments have, have <coughs> come through, I think about three quarters of them anyway, I'm pretty close. So out of the two million that originally uh, contributed to us. So anyway, that's, that's about the building project. Now, as far as next year's operating budget goes, um, if we can just go to the next slide, Jim, that'd be good. There we go. So, you probably, I think you already heard, we're proposing a 2.3% increase, and we're proposing the same increase for the contribution from the districts. So, um, that takes us to a little 10.8 million, and the increase for all six districts combined is 179,507. Now, if you go to the next slide, it shows what your contribution would be. Um, yours actually goes up a little bit more than that, and that's because of the formula for enrollment and average daily memberships, which on the next slide I'll get to. Um, so as you can see here, um, you're at 11.679% next year. And this year that we're currently in, 11.554% of the total is, is what Southern owed. Based on the, the formula, which if we go to that next slide, so most of you probably have heard this from me other years. Some of you may be new and don't. Uh, or is anybody new on this board this year? You are. Yeah, of course. But you've heard it at our meeting, how we calculate this. So the Articles of Agreement use a... a formula that has two factors. They're both based on enrollment and average daily memberships. Um, the first part of the formula, 50% of it, is based on how your district compares, your average daily membership compares to the other the other five districts. Um, and then the other 50% of the formulas, let me go back, your average daily membership in kindergarten through 12th grade versus the other, so your total average daily membership. Then the other 50% of the, of the calculations based on What's your average daily membership at low tech? Okay, so as you can see, even though your total average daily membership from K through 12 has gone down over the years, your percentage is actually a little bit higher this year than it was last year for that component because some of the other districts went down even more, believe it or not. Um, now your average daily membership of students who come to low tech has gone up. 
And as a matter of fact, this year, I think you're at 78 or 79 kids right now. That's got to be close to a record. Yes. Uh, you have 27, 27 freshmen. Yeah. 27 freshmen this year. Yeah. Um, so. Tony, if you start doing 27 kids every year, you have 100. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, we really appreciate that. And I, uh, so that's, that's great. So that number is going up. So um, overall, the percentage of the total that Southern Columbia contributes is 11.679%. So that's how we come up with that number. Okay. Uh, down there, Jim, please. Okay, so this pretty much is the same every year. Where do our expenses, what do we spend our money on? Salaries, payroll taxes, retirement expense, 80% of the entire budget. The other 20% goes to other things, which I'm going to show you on this next slide. There we go. Supplies, equipment books. And when I say supplies, that's for all the vocational programs. That's all the supplies. We reuse a lot. We always have. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the wood gets reused. A lot of the, uh, anything that can be reused pretty much does. Or we get donations from local companies that help this as well. Uh, we get welding, welding supplies from local companies. Um, electricity gets, gets things donated. Uh, Mechatronics has had a lot donated. Um, <clears throat> and then you can see, I'm not going to read them all off to you, but that's where the other expenses come from. Um, outside services are not only legal services, but I group everything in there. Like if, if we buy comply to frontline software, things like that, I include it in outside services. Um, there are state utilities and repairs. Repairs includes repairs to equipment in the classrooms as well, not just maintenance repairs. That's also, also, you know, every year we have at least a couple pieces of equipment that need something, either welding, printing, yeah. Do you charge for admission to your athletic events? Yes. Thank you. You take cash? <laughs> That's a double down right there. Just like, <laughs> has that been a point of You talk about that a lot. <laughs> you're going to waste your 10 minutes on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just keep going, boss. All right. Any questions so far? Anything? No. Okay. All right, Jim. Okay. So, where does our money come from? Most of it comes from six districts, 73% uh, of it. That's where the 7.9 million comes from. The remainder comes from that state funding. You see 17%. Well, only about 700,000 of that is actually a, a vocational subsidy that we get from the state. The rest of that's just reimbursement for the retirement we pay in and the, the FICA right. that we pay in. We get half of that back. So that's so it's that's actually not funding. It's just getting back what you pay in, um, but it goes into the revenue. Um, I I do put this small piece of federal funding. I show it to you on the budget, even though it's grant money. I put it there, and I do show the I, I include the expenditures too, just to show everybody because that's a pretty much we get that every year. That's Perkins funding. That has to be used for vocational education. Um, that's gone up in the last couple of years. It used to be about 150,000. The last two years, it's been closer to 200,000. We use that primarily on paraprofessional salaries. And they, they've been in place. We're not supplanting. Those are been paid for with Perkins since well before I've been there, I believe. Um, and then we are usually able to buy a, a piece of equipment or so with, with that as well every year. Um, and then uh, we are still dipping into to balance the budget. We are still using some fund balance. Now we've been pretty pretty good the last few years, and uh, we continue to look for ways to find find things that, for example, one of the reasons we're at 2.3% increase instead of our normal four or five, we eliminated the assistant principal position. And what we did is we took a bargaining unit member and made that person a dean of students this year. So somebody we already had we gave we did give a, a stipend for for that of five thousand dollars there's actually ten thousand in this budget um but we eliminated basically about one hundred thirty thousand dollars of expense that way by doing that and it's working out great by the way it's it really is it's it, 
we couldn't have asked for anything more. I mean, do you, I mean, you, yeah, I think it's working out pretty good. I mean, you know, they're, they're always going to want more. They're real, the individual is realizing everything that goes into being an administrator and the, the discipline side of things and dealing, um, dealing with some parents that can, you know, not always be, uh, you know, be, uh, all, you know, brave as you when you're talking about their child you know, having an infraction or so, but it's, it's working out pretty good. And that's why, yeah, we do have a little bit more money here more than there because we anticipate. But what we're finding out is it's, it's taking quite a bit more of his time than when, when what we originally thought it was going to. He has to stay much later, a lot of days, and and uh, we kind of estimated this year. We tried to get a guess on what it would be, and we're finding out it's more than that. So that's why we put a little bit more in for next year. Um, that leave us with one a little over one point three million at the end of next year. Um, now you know if we if we here again, we're always looking for things like this, and we do anticipate a few retirements over the next couple of years. But when I do the projection, I don't, I don't, I don't know for sure that people are retiring, so I leave them in, and you'll see it'll show that we're slowly using our fund balance over the next few years. Um, but um, typically, we we can find some things that can offset some of that, um, and we'll continue to look for things that will offset that. But uh, yeah, so you know, pretty much we, we use this five-year outlook so we can, as an administration and as a GOC, look for things that that can uh, lets us know where we are if we remain the same. But we're we're actively pursuing a number of different grants right now. Um, just to just to give you an idea, I know we've uh, just for the PPCD grants funding there, we've applied for over half a million dollars there. Um, one's competitive, you know. There's no Probably not a, a better chance of us getting it, but we're we're still applying. We can't we can't get it if you don't ask for it. So we're actively seeking that, and then uh, uh, Mr. Becker, uh, a couple other things too that we on the horizon in terms of some grants. So we're looking at that, but always, um, always you know trying to you know, be good stewards of the money and uh, the budget, obviously. And Josh, contract teacher contract is uh, is uh, there's one more year. And you usually ask me these questions, so yeah, <laughs> so. Uh, next year is the next year, 2024-25, um, and support staffs 2027, 2026-27. Negotiations are yeah, negotiations. negotiations will yeah we haven't started yet, but we yeah we'll start probably early next year at some point. Yep, that'll be fun. <laughs> Always it is. <laughs> but yeah, so so any any other questions? I know a few of you said, please don't take too much of my time tonight. So <laughs> I, I'm trying not to. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for having us, everybody. Appreciate the time. Thanks for visiting. Yeah. Okay. Questions that you can. Oh, you do have them. Yes. Yeah. You guys have room for solar panels anywhere? We are yeah. looking here. Yeah. We do. We do have room. We're, we, you know, um, so far we've met with them for and they're getting some numbers around for us on what that would. I know you have. Have you finalized? Yeah, we've yeah. done So we'll probably look into the company used as well. And uh, yeah, we have a pretty good track of land. We could, we could put some on down there. We can bring on the numbers for mm -hmm. 18 months. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you can get the incentives or look at the with that, yeah, the, we got new, the new incentives that are available. Yeah, yeah. Tony was talking with Laura, I think, the other day. Yeah. And I had some leads too that um, yeah. just some different programs we're looking at. Those are just one more thing that we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, it might you get fifty percent off of it, basically. Okay, it, it's an over it. Yeah, that's yeah. if you pay for it outright yourself, but then you get the federal refund. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's so many Ball different fund. versions of how yeah, that didn't fund. exist until okay. six months ago okay. or so. Yeah. So the first year of our conversations in, didn't they even know that, that, right. that, 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 that dramatically changes the, 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 the financial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Aspect of it makes it a lot more attractive if you uh, do it yourself. Uh, just one other thing I like to mention: our co-op program. We have, I think, right around 70 kids out now. With a lot now that juniors are eligible, we'll have quite a few more out here. And I, you know, here again, some of you, are, all of you, have always been very supportive of that as well. So I appreciate that. All right, Tony. When do we approve? Is it? Uh, you can approve it if you have another board meeting this month. Uh, if you have a board meeting this month, to the motion group. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll put it on for next okay. Monday. Is that yeah. Okay. What time? Uh, what just for a 
Kendall and, and Jim to make sure they know what's the requirement pass it. How does that work? Oh, it's yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. So weird. the requirement, the way our budget gets passed is it has to be four of the six districts approve it and a majority of the total members of all of those districts. So there are 54, yeah, there are six districts, nine each, 54, so 20, 28, right? 28 members total. Four districts, 28 total, total votes. Thanks. Three, yes. Got it. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. 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 Thank
The only, only suggestion I would say is, is if there is an open ditch, if there's anything that we could possibly, that's going to possibly go bad or anything else, I would rather put the money in PVC pipe and other things that it could be, it, it's a way of getting down there and we can use it because otherwise something will go on and then we have to dig the ditch and the excavating of the ditch is more expensive than the PVC pipe that goes into it. Well, that's just an open ditch. That's what we were looking at. That we can use. Two, three inch PVC conduits down. Whatever, whatever. If there's anything, you have to look into what we can use it for down there or what we can tee off of it so that way if by happen chance, you know, you can <clears throat> bring it off and we and we have to do a small ditch to the, the sewage treatment or whatever. If we need something down there, uh, it's a lot easier with an open ditch than it is with having to big old brand new one and run overhead. What all goes down the hill? So sewage, sewage goes down, the well line comes up. Where's the well down there? The, um, all the way down to the bottom? Right at the corner of the, the big parking lot down there, when you first come in, yeah. right at the corner there, and then it goes from there to the pump house, which is like back in the woods a little bit, and then from there it shoots up over there. Yeah. But it's better. I don't think they'll have that. I mean, fiber. you're talking conduit for fiber. Yeah. And, and, and there, there's, there's, there actually, there's power down there, so we might not have to run it, but it's always good to have another conduit yeah. if we need. The tank cost. The point is, you know, do any of those, are we worried about any of those pipes needing to be replaced um, as well? So, like the water line coming up or two well, lines going back yeah, down, well, a lot of ditches open. Up. Big part of that water line. Yeah, that, well, I know. Replace the big part of that water line. Yeah, place you know, part of it. I'm just saying that it's better to do it than have it there and have to dig a little hole down to get to it than it is to, you know, have to dig a hole. What size is the water line? What's that? How, what size is the water line that comes up? I think it's two inches. Yeah, I think it's two inch line. So they, they were talking about digging a, a two foot trench. And putting our conduit on this side, their conduit on this side, and they'd have enough room. They're looking for what they, what yeah, they like a hook between each conduit they gotta have between each shower they'd like to have between ours and theirs. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As we get more information, so the first thing they're going to come and do is do some uh, soil testing, and then that's 30 days. That that What's that for? Yeah. Start the way the pile, the, the columns that are driven in the ground, they have to know what to coat them with based on what the environment yeah. is. That's awesome. that's how they do that. Things, they're going to dig some ditches and for do rack geo testing. Yeah. Basically. For compaction or for your I'm, concern? Is, I believe erosion was the concept of like what they put in the ground if there was, they said they would yeah. coat it. Uh, Yes, yeah, so yeah, that worked. Yeah. The kind of like the metal would decay. So they they, they said that whatever they make these rack units that they uh -huh. coat them in a appropriate weather resistant yeah. to the soil. Weather resistant. I, they were, it was a little technical, honestly, but they were pretty specific about the thought of the details. We're, if you like, we're planning some meetings in the future. If you're available. Please. And and there you could probably ask better questions than I can. And there are, uh, one thing I came out of that meeting comfortable with is uh, communication. Uh, so uh, it's gonna be constant communication. We talked about meetings. Our next meeting's not for thirty days, but once things go and it'll be on a weekly basis and that will there'll be uh, people on site and uh, on site I do feel comfortable that there'll be good line of communication. Who who from the school is our main point of contact for managing this project? Mr. Yeah. Right. So you'll get you'll get copies of all of their reports, like the soil testing and how they plan. Like this is different than McClure's building it and running it, and we're buying power from them. So right. it's on them to build it nice and good. We own this thing from the start, so right. we need to make sure that we don't end up with a situation where we have a track that we can't use for events because it's the wrong size or something like that. Right? Like, for example, right? Yeah, like of course, we we need to make sure we're on top of this. So, um, I I think it'd probably be prudent 
to have somebody in. Does Josh want to be involved? Yeah, I think Josh should be involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Or, or Ms. Kendall Josh. over there, um, you know, somebody who builds things like this frequently. Um, I think it, it, it just keep the board in the loop on whatever and then whoever's available. It probably makes sense for one of us to be present whenever we're having some sort of technical discussion just to give you back up. Yeah, and we'll share all the information that we have. I mean, we, we have a lot of really good resources on this board that we should use that, that may not be normal. We do have those are appreciated. We do have some initial drawings and stuff that I can have scanned. In. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. We'll see. Mark, you can mm -hmm. put those updates in like a Friday letter. If there's anything that's uh, oh, yeah. Sure. absolutely yeah, that's probably and, and maybe in this case we might not even wait till Friday letters and we'll get them. We'll just yeah, just send them as they come. Yeah. It's just I mean this is it's a sizable investment and it's yeah. it is a technically challenging project compared to most that we do here. Um, yeah. Rather we catch things before there's a problem. Agreed. Oh. Okay, next uh, topic is the power outages. Um, we did have a meeting last week with a representative from you know, and uh, we did get some information back on Friday. I think we we'll shared on that email. Um, looks like they're going to cut some trees down. So, um, well, beyond that, uh, we did. It was surprising that we were notified that school don't meet criteria of a vital facility. That was uh, shocking a little bit. Um, so I guess my question is, um, I wasn't, me personally, I wasn't happy with the response. I knew we were meeting today, uh, so I figured we, we'd talk about this. And we talked about all of this last week in a public meeting, so I'm not, I'm not uh, shy of talking about this publicly. When I opened the email, I text Josh Hoagland and said, the PUC can play one per meter. That's yeah. where I am at. So we have no response from pb at this time? Yeah, we have a response. It's just... What did it say? I, didn't, I don't know if I saw it. It essentially said, if the landowners will allow us to cut down trees, we'll cut down trees, but everything else is... Uh, yeah. Uh, only Hoagland and I were on it as far as the board. There's no board. I thought it was the board. I was looking at it. We'll wrap it up. Josh just my phone. Yeah, I heard she said. Well, long story short, the reply was no, they're not going to change how they look at custom routages. They're going to keep just looking at the number of meters out, even are they active or not, or you know what's behind that meter. Uh, no, they're not going to consider bearing the problem line that is at five of the recent outages in a 100 yard stretch. They will not look at putting that underground. Or relocating it um, and if we have aspirations of assisting our local community in areas outside of education engineering firms should be consulted for an electrical study to help us figure that out because they're not going to get power on here any quicker wow so, that's impressive that was my okay. takeaway from the email um, and I'm in total agreement with Brian well I'm in queries with PUC you do realize that the PUC is only going to build a that we just it goes used. to that guy. Yeah, those complaints will come back for the guy that's PA, but just then he has to respond to them. Get all file one. <laughs> I, I mean, the school has six meters, right? Yes. So that's six different complaints for the same issue. And I can say, even when it's sunny out and clear, I um, still have power outages. We had a 20 minute power outage or so, 30 minute power yeah. outage either. The other week, and then we had today. Yeah, today. It, 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 it will flicker, flickered on and off. So. And, and I brought that up at that meeting. I said, This isn't something that's just going to happen in the winter. I said, For the amount of dead trees that are out there, just for example, today, yesterday, the high winds we had, there's trees come down. Yeah, it, it's going to be a yearly occurrence if we get high winds or whatever. And we made clear that 30 minutes might not be a big deal when you're a homeowner, but when you have to decide if you can still flush toilets and send kids home from school, 30 minutes disrupts. Education. And it couldn't happen at a worse time. It happened lunch about time. 28 minutes from lunch. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and we were in lunch. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. yeah. So, from the PPL standpoint, um, I don't think there's any point in continuing to engage with them. We're not going to get anywhere. I think the PUC complaints are unlikely to bear fruit, but that's really our only recourse. I mean, if Josh wants to keep contacting whoever he 
previously had to see if we can get any additional pressures from our you know, state representatives. Um, we've already opened that communication, so. Um, but it, I mean, it, it sounds like it sounds like they're going to cut a bunch of trees. Uh, they're not any. They're not dead trees because the lines were just cleared out. I mean, everything was just trimmed two years ago. So this is all. They're all live trees. Um, something like 50 or something, a little over 50, I heard, but, um, which is expensive for PPL to do, but I don't know that that's going to resolve our problem, especially in the problem area. That 100-yard section has trees on both sides, and you'd have to basically dig a whole mountain to not have one of the trees possibly fall down. And as you cut more of these trees, you open up other trees to wind that they didn't experience before, so you make them more likely to fall down. So I don't know that we're in the clear here, but so that's the PPL side. I, I think PUC complaints that, you know, for each meter, and then that's about it. It's not worth wasting our time with them anymore. Maybe, maybe though, we have a discussion about generators uh, for the, you know, three different buildings on campus and what that would look like. Have we had any conversations? We yeah, actually had, so you let us into the next. Uh, conversation regarding this. So um, we did meet with representatives from the court just to, just to kind of brainstorm some ideas. I think the first thing we're going to look at is um, they, they don't feel our high school generator is a, he, he quoted it a 15 kilowatt uh, generator. The one, the, the, yeah. the, the one in the elementary school is 40, a little bigger. Um, he thinks we might be able to elementary school um, and you know connect the connect the uh, circulator pumps to that so we might be able to add some to the elementary generator high school generator in those fields but they're going to come out and take a look and give us give us an opinion uh, they feel the best thing to do is uh, use generators to, to try to get us through uh, so not again not running school but just making sure we don't get damage in school uh, so maybe increasing the power of generators which is maybe even a new generator um, so they're they're going to come out and give us a look and an, an estimate an idea of what where we should go with that we did one when does that happen hopefully soon um, we just talked with them today and yeah. Melissa said and I, they Chris, may not even have to come up because they have all the information. They have all the plans there. He was just going to look at it. Chris Schultz, he's one of their engineers. He's going to look at it and uh, uh, get back to us with some information and maybe take an outside visit. So we anticipate a huge difference in cost for a generator that keeps us from freezing up in versus powering school. The transfer switch is the issue. What is why would we not just try and keep school open? Of the generator. So uh, I think I think one of the things is that what you mentioned we were talking breaking up that vehicle to run. So there's I, I think there's two different tiers here. There's what can we do immediately, right? Like like in the case of the elementary, if it's it's just a matter of adding some wiring to make it <clears throat> possible to run circulator pumps and, and you know, a little bit more heat. Uh, off of the existing generator, then we should probably move with that quickly. And if it's talking about upgrading a generator, then that's a different discussion of, okay, how big do we go and what loads do we want to actually carry and what's the difference in cost to do just a little bit that gets us, you know, yeah. bare minimum for heat, like Bree's saying, versus what would it take to put, to just keep the building open? Mm -hmm. I think. So the, the, those are kind of questions right. that you proposed. That, that's where we and go then, if we end up. So with that. that's where we start talking about cost analysis. That, yeah. You know what's for if this is going to continue on a, on a regular basis, and it's not been just a couple of years where I, I couldn't remember uh, at the time where we had an outage here that caused us to shut school, and we would we'd have a for a twenty minutes, half hour. You know that type of thing that it would come back on. We've had that, uh, but not like we have. Nothing like we've had these last couple of years, especially this year. This year has been 
three days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, things been four. It's because we're two miles from the substation, and it's normally not a lot of distance to have to worry about trees falling. It's, but like we said, five of the out of have been on a hundred yard section. Right. And and if they're not going to do anything about that section, you know, honestly, it might be cheaper for us to ask people now, but we can pay the bear. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It might be cheaper. I don't than the generator. Option. Yeah, I just I, I don't know. I agree with that. I mean, that is a real yeah. question for the for that hundred yard. Now, they probably don't own that land though, so I know it's that matters. Well, but, but I think we could probably convince the landowner to let them bury it. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, because the other problem with the generators are here. You know, they okay. they take fuel and they need maintenance, and you know, they they bury the wires correctly, and the trees don't matter. You know, there's a lot less maintenance of those kind of things. You know, they don't. Like my development, we rarely use power because from the substation of my development, it's all underground. But that's, I live in a newer development. So. I mean, we could, I, I don't know how we, but that's a question. Yeah. Well, it, maybe. Is that something that you'd be interested in entertaining? Should I, I, we should ask that question. I mean, I just, I, I'm, my mind says a generator to run this building is expensive. It doesn't necessarily have to be bury the line, it could be relocate. As well, I don't know which would be cheaper for them. If they just relocate, like they just have to move it 50 yards east across Bethel, and it's in the clear. Like there's going to freeze there. That's might be an opportunity. That's the same landowner as the other side. Not paying for the whole thing, but at least split some of the cost. I, they're not going to be interested in doing any cost the way it sounds, but it's it's worth proposing. Um, we're also going solar. We're going to stop paying them. They're going to yeah, I mean that's. that's which they don't care about. I mean, our business really means nothing to them. But that's yeah. apparent from the email. Clearly. It is very clear that we're yeah, clearly. Right. I mean, there's some people out there that are several hundred times us. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's a little little speck. For a blip. Uh, the, the representative said right out, he says, we're not going to fix what's not broken. Right. So they, right they don't see it as broken. They don't see their approach to response they, as broken. They don't see their prioritization as wrong. They look at it as there's, there's five outages in the last five years. Yeah. And there's only 250 Little. meters. There's only 250 meters on that whole line, yeah. right? Of which we are not. It doesn't matter that there's 1,300 you know, people behind these six meters. It's six, that's how they see it. So. But anyway, I, I think it's worth exploring all those options. Um, in the end, I mean, having a, gener a generator to carry at least the you know, the ne you know, necessary loads to keep the heat on. Uh, it's probably something we're going to want regardless. Like, so my principal concern is why do we have to pay for this at all? Right? They're a heavily regulated utility. We don't get to choose whose lines we use. We can choose the supplier, but not the lines. So I want to pursue this. See what comes of that before you do nothing really expensive. I mean, even if we offer to bury the lines, if they're going to continue to not prioritize this anytime it goes out somewhere else on the line, then we haven't necessarily helped ourselves and reduce the chance of going out from that. But even right now, if we went out from that and they just said, hey, there's 1,300 people we could get back up in an hour if we go there first, then we wouldn't need to bury the line or clear the trees. I think that's the, uh, you know, the gist of the PUC complaint is why are we treated as six meters and not... 1,300 people times the, you know, exponential effects of all of the people that are affected when we spend those, send those 1,300 people home, um, or those 1,300 people stay home for a day, right? Like all of the other impacts across the region that occur when we close. It, and, um, and the other thing is, our school is the hub of our community. So if we were able to be open, we could be a maybe not an official shelter or vital in their terms, but we be able to open our doors for a one station, you know? Yeah, so I, I don't see any of these things as uh, an exclusive path forward, right? It's not if, if this or that, it's I think we do all these things. It's the PUC complaints and we try to push for them to change the way they prioritize us. And, right, the PUC complaint's not gonna get them to bury the line. But it may get them to prioritize us in response to the, you know, an outage. Um, from state representatives or whoever we can, PDE or you know whatever, whatever, whatever we can get through the, the governor's office if we can get some contact there. 
Um, I think we do that to, to push on PPL, to move them in the right direction. But at the same time, I think in parallel, we have to explore what we're actually going to do to keep the school, one, to keep the building safe so we don't have to worry about, oh, let's drain all this stuff. Um, and then two, we also consider what it would look like to just have uninterrupted power to keep this building open, whatever. Like, so we don't have to worry about sending kids home. So maybe the air conditioning doesn't need to run off that, but we need the heat. And then once you have, but if we're putting the heat on here anyway, that's the primary, like, I don't, I don't know what our other large loads are. Lighting isn't that significant with everything's LED in the buildings now. I um, think, uh, so the uh, plumbing, the water pumps and stuff would be a bit of water pumps in the sewage treatment plant. Uh, okay. Put on them. Right, that's significant. And, and it isn't even, it isn't even heat they're looking at putting on. They're just, as long as we're circulating water. Yeah. We're, like, I know, but we had also spoke about, like, last meeting, we, we said about what would it take to go a step further and right. actually keep the heat on, which then if you do that, then it's, why not just keep everything up? But I think there is going to be a substantial difference in cost. Right. Yeah. Just, you know, bare minimum to, on that same note, for circulators, did you get any word on glycol? So we talked about the glycol a little bit, and um, they did. They just didn't when they put the new units in. Um, Melissa said it just wasn't feasible. Like they, they, there's more maintenance to it than than it's than it's worth. She said we don't really put glycol in our systems. She said it, it's something we can do. She said, but it's not. She said I would rather look at the like putting the circulator pumps on and just having them run in the book light hole. Then you're looking at feeders, you're looking at pumps for them. You're, you know, it's just more maintenance. Pumps for what? For the light hole pumps. Because you, I, I guess with the light hole, you have to have a feeder system to make sure that the levels of the light hole stay the same. According, according Where's to where it's going. Huh? If you have any kind of loss of any type, they have to make sure the sort of blue water goes back into it and keeps it at a correct level. That I get. That would be the only thing but I can <laughs> with. You have your automatic fill when you get How come the pipes under the school say glycol on them right now? So there's a picture from, picture of uh, Carissa was down, Mrs. Long was down in the uh, fallout shelter. Correction, Dr. Long now. Dr. Long was down in the fallout shelter with her class doing a lesson on, I don't know, was on the school webpage or Facebook. And in the background, there's very large pipes and they say glycol heat that way. Glycol heat return that way. So at one time, the very large, time we did, the very large pipes had glycol in them. I think when they had the steam but <clears throat> I think it was before the prod, the no. new boilers put in. When the new units were put in over at the elementary. Yeah, but there wasn't that one the night fall. It's something we can ask if I could find that out. Yeah, we'll okay. So we need a better answer on why we can't just put glycol in the system. Like what are we actually talking about here? What would it cost to put glycol in and all of the necessary support systems that they think we need to add to do all that? What's the added maintenance cost for a, an extra sample a month or whatever it takes? If we're talking about spending probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to upgrade the generators, we need to know the comparative cost to just put glycol in and the feeder pump and whatever else we think we need to compare it, right? Like that's if so yes, it may cost twenty grand, but that's a lot less than a hundred, right? Like, so I think we can get that. Where we ended our conversation was they were going to look at the existing uh, generators to see what they what those existing generators could do, and then from there, yes, and they just want to run the circulators, which is what we had said, like right, as long as right. keep it moving. Right. Do we need glycol in all the units, or only the ones that have the exterior? I don't know the answer. It wasn't really. You know what I mean? Like, well, because it would be in the whole system. It's the whole system. It's, all closed, it's a closed They're loop. All it all closed comes up. back and runs through the boiler and goes out. That's why I needed to know. Which is why, was why I was missing. Which is why when discussion of 
managing the levels of glycol, like, get it now. If it's not leaking out, where's it going? Is your, the, the concentration doesn't change if nothing leaks out. So the only time it leaks out, if you have a known leak, which you could easily measure, we could, we could set electronic monitoring on the fill line for water coming back in and say, it has put this much in over the last three days. And then we would have to take some action rather than having some automated glycol feeder system that we would just have to manually do something at that point. And really we wouldn't even have to do anything if it wasn't the dead of winter. Right? Like the only time it matters that we have glycol in there is the three month period where things might freeze if the power goes out. And so we check it before that. And then we could check it every day if we had to for the, when the power's out. Like, um, I got you. I, I would need a better explanation to just leave this alone than it costs more and requires more maintenance because that doesn't. I think it was something they said they could do, but again, it was. Right, the glycol, the glycol itself is expensive. Yeah. Right, to yeah. add that especially for the size of the system we're talking about. It's, it's going to be very expensive to add if it's not yeah, already there. A lot less than but it, again, should be a lot less than what we're talking about for generator upgrades. If, unless we want to upgrade the generator to keep the school open, which is a whole other level of discussion, and then you don't have to do any of this because you'll always have power. But I think we need all of these options and budget numbers for cost to actually have a real conversation. So and if I could raise your blood pressure just slightly more, um, a suggestion to consider, because I don't think we'll have this done by June 30th is, we haven't done this here before, at least not in my time, is to consider viewing our financials for this school year more strongly than we do before year end and make a capital reserve transfer. Uh, so many school districts that say, you know, you brought in 100, you spent 90, so you have 10 left. So at the end of the school year, they will move 10% of the money into capital reserve. We don't do that here, and that's fine. We build our capital reserve very slowly. You know, we usually contribute between 75,000 to 100,000, but then spend some roof repairs and other things. Um, so, you know, we could build capital reserve for these types of needs in the future. We wouldn't have to spend on anything except I'm happy capital. to move, like, I, I would support moving all but your working capital to capital reserve. Well, so the, once it goes to 32, it can never come back. So it's okay to leave some in our general fund fund balance. You can simply restrict it if you'd like. We actually have. Okay, so that's some. what you mean by capital reserve. The capital reserve is fund 32. Not yeah. the, not, no, not, not, not restricted or committed. Okay. okay. Yes, I apologize. So yeah, no, we have currently well, six or seven million committed. Right. Right now. We have very little that's uncommitted, right? Correct. It well, because we can only keep 8%. Yes. But so I actually, I actually mean moving it to fund 32. The reason for capital reserve or capital projects, fund 32, is once it's there, it remains there. It can only be used for things like generator repair, bearing power lines, you know, bathroom upgrades. Right, so facilities. next year if we had a $100,000 need in excess of what was ever in capital reserve, we just move money at that time into capital that, reserve, right? That's correct. So so the, the concept is, you know, kind of, we put 25000 away for a truck, we put 25000 away for, I think, the sound system, you know, so those are over there in fund 32 and eventually be used for something like that. So, you know, I, I'm just suggesting that a lot of my, I just came from a conference and a lot of my business manager partners talked to me and they said, well, how much do you move to capital reserve? And I said, well, we usually move between 75 to 100 and then 50 for the turf. And uh, they're like, oh, that's, you know, less than they commit. And I just said, well, that's not our focus. We're leaving it in committed and reserve restricted funds. Right. And that's where we're keeping it, and we'll move it as needed. Here's the thing: never has to go to 32 to pay for these expenditures. But sometimes there's logic in doing it because it isolates it. So, so you know, I, I would say it would make sense if if the board has active, a yeah. dentist and active how the how the administration proposes to spend capital reserve or right. our capital reserves, mm -hmm. right? Like our actual fund, fund balance. Yeah, yeah, the fund balance. So. If we were not involved, not involved, or if we were akin to just spend, you know, to buy new carpet and and sound systems for, 
It's all then it would make sense. <laughs> what buildings up and when uh, the population of the school was going down. Yeah. All, I'm, all I'm said. doing is is restricting our options yeah. when yeah. the time comes. But I mean, yeah. So we can we can keep it committed as we do now in general fund ten. Uh, but know that that's an option if the board ever would like to consider that we can put additional funds. And what you typically do near your end is just say, oh, we had a this much extra, extra and you put right. some of it over with the concept of then. It'll be used for future needs, such as what we're talking about. But it would not be used to reduce next year's budget need then. Correct. Which, right, like, that's the opposite of our approach is, yes. you know. I wanted you to talk to it. How do we reduce the amount that we have to increase exactly. our revenue to? It would lower your fund balance. Cost. Yes, it would. Right. So, yeah. so it's just a discussion to talk, and I, I, I'm glad you guys are so involved, so never change. But <laughs> know that you do have an option. So with McClure, I just say uh, I'm always leery of the person who's selling the the options of uh, are you selling me the cheapest option, the most expensive option, or the smartest option, right? So you know when they say it's a pain to do glycol, well, pain for who? For them because like they don't get paid a lot and it's labor intensive, or a pain for us. So just I'd ask you to be leery and. You know, well, yeah, I think I think the initial least expensive. Manner, and that's kind of how we put it and started. What's the least invasive? Yeah. Is check out what we have and what can we do? Can we expand yeah. with it? That type of thing, and then go from there. It's going to call the next thing is the like they're going to look at our generators and say, you know, we're going to give us some ideas about a new generator or two new generators, right? And just you know? like if the elementary circulator pumps can be run by the existing generator for very little investment to get there, then. There's no need for glycol in that system. You just keep the water moving through those outdoor units, and it, that's fine. If we have to upgrade in the high school or the middle school in order to do that, then then it's worth the conversation of what's the difference in cost. And that's, we only maybe need one building open in an emergency situation. Perhaps. You know, you know, I'm just saying like, to, not, to well, keep things from freezing. I get you, but not even you, keep the building. That's right. keeping the building warm. That's. That's so that three days in with no power, Scott doesn't have to rush around with my or right, drain NRG or whoever sure. to, to drain. Right. My thinking was that, you know, let's say we were going, like, money wasn't an option, right? But we only wanted to have one site be fully, because they are separate power needs, you know, so you yeah. could do A and then maybe a couple years down the line do B. I really just doesn't solve all the problems, but uh, fiscally. But I think it's worth having all these numbers because then we, we as a you as an administration, we as a board need to decide what are we actually, what's the, what are we trying to solve, right? Like, sure. at the bare minimum, we need to keep stuff from freezing, freezing. Right? Right. and breaking, because then we're down for many days, right. right, or weeks, and many costs that come with that, many dollars, right? But if if we think it is a priority to not have school interrupted for the half hour, or 20 minutes, to not have a day or an early dismissal, you know, if if that is the concern, then that's a that's a bigger discussion, right? That's that's more investment needed than, but then none of these other small things even need to happen. Then we need to just sure. So cost is important. Yeah, we need to know it to, to understand what we're doing. I think. Uh, you had mentioned about the diesel generator, the fuel being so old. Have you looked into doing anything to get that? Cleaned out, changed, additive, anything done before there is a problem that it won't run? Not yet, but we will, we'll, I will look into it. Like, I, I I don't know the life expectancy of diesel fuel or fuel oil, so, but. Well, from what you're talking, it's quite old, so. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, yeah, I can say I've been here eight years and haven't done anything or haven't, I haven't even added to it. Well, and, and what I'm going to say now is, that generator was put in, I think, when did, what did you say, back in the 80s? I think it was like 71. I think it was when so that fuel system was designed to run on number two diesel fuel. What you're getting now and probably mixing is low sulfur fuel. Those systems aren't designed to handle that low sulfur fuel. It takes the lubricity out of them. Eventually, it's going to cause a problem in that injection system. Then you're not going to have a generator. So you need to look into it. I know you said it runs, what, an hour every Monday? Yeah, every Monday. Every morning, so you want to look into that. With me at home, 
now running my equipment, I have to get low sulfur desiccant. I have to put a university additive in to help maintain so I don't have problems. So it's going to be a problem. Yeah, I'll look at those. It may be the case that the fuel we're running is still from 1970 or 1980. <laughs> if it hasn't been topped off, yeah, it's, it's a good possibility. But the first time we fill it, it's going to be a significant problem if we don't. So nobody has any issues with opening some inquiries with PUC and Chase and Adam with our elected representatives. I don't know why you fill all up so we can't. It's like on the diesel. The diesel generator over there. Anybody like change the fuel filter or anything? Well, I think, I think, it's I think it's it does get fully yeah. serviced. It gets fully yeah. serviced once a year. All right. That's part of the NRG contract or the McClure? No, uh, the that. company mechanical services comes in and, okay. and separately. Uh, yeah. Okay. Separate. They do that. They do all three of them. What's the good news about the dugout? Hey, so <laughs> the dugout's up. Um, this needs to be painted, and yeah, and it'll get painted when it, uh, when the weather's warmer. So we're working on uh, the next thing, which would be some kind of protective uh, threshold. One said, "Yep, Ballard." You send that out to everybody. I think I think you shared that with everybody. I think I, I so um, so that would be the next thing. I know Fullington is. Uh, they're not parking there. They're doing everything they've said. So, which is good to see. Um, we have that on. Camera, video. So now we're just working on that. The next, the next phase, and that's protection. So if we move forward with doing the ballers. We want to make sure that they're tight enough that a corner of the bus doesn't go through them and still make contact. And how far enough for that? For that. Right. Um, either tight or no fit. And we want to make sure that they're the kind that are <clears throat> solid into the ground, not just anchor on the top or. Stop to stop the vehicle. Yeah. My thoughts would be to just dig a trench. Uh, I think they, well, you can get them custom. You can get them whatever side you want. Um, at least four feet in the ground, four feet sticking out, and then just pour the whole um, trench of concrete. So, are you going to get a bit on this job? Or are you I, just talking about doing it? I have no idea. I just said, Last meeting, I sent that there's dollars that you can easily drill a hole in the ground and drop them into a casing. So I'm, I'm working, uh, talking in conversation with Paul to see how acceptable they are to it. Uh, they're, you know, with their plan, they think, you know, having a uh, a monitor as someone backs up and not parking any cars there would, would solve their will solve their issue. Um, yeah, I still think there's money enough room there that's, that's fully spending money to. Yeah. So and having having anything there, I, I just I foresee um, things getting hit. Uh, some of our light standards that are in our parking lots, I, I witnessed one of our elementary parents hit a light standard in an elementary parking lot. So I, I you know I just worried about maybe not a bus hitting it, but something else hitting those. Bowers that are there. So, uh, so when, when I start with weighing safety versus you know, that type. Besides a garbage truck. Three buses and a garbage truck. Yeah, and over the last 30 years. Well, that's just since I've been here. <laughs> well, you mean prior to? Prior to. Prior to. Prior to, you have prior to yeah. I don't think I, he's ever been hit. No, I asked him. I asked the old mechanic and he said I mean, no. So, so. Unless Fullington is going to pay for this protection or whatever it is, which sounds like they're not going to. Well, it's not that they're not going to. We're in discussion. Well, I'm just saying that unless unless they were, I mean, there's not a real sense for us to put it in at our expense. For me, I mean, that it's them that's hitting it. Not like well, it. If, if they're not parking there, if they're if they've act actively changed. The way they're doing, the way they're them. operating, there, and they then. go back to the last thirty years and never hit it again. That would be one. It, it, there is a difference. Like I've, I've watched buses come out of there, and there is a difference when there's no cars or no trucks, anything parked in that area. Well, I can imagine the sign of uh, the line of vision wide is open. wide open. 
that type of thing. Plus, I think the only people that are moving in buses in and out of that area are the mechanics. So um, there's limited people parking there, and, and they used to. They used to. I used to hear them on the radio. Uh, I need DEF. Okay, park it in front of Bay One. That type of thing. Now it's done. Everything's you know parking your spot. The mechanics will go out and get it, bring it in, take it back up. So. Paving project. Okay, so paving project. Um, okay, so we we are we are going we get we get some prices from paving. Yeah. Uh, we did get one from uh, what was that? The low bar. Yeah, low bar. Um, what was KPN? Here's a KPN. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we talked about. Um, you know this this project, um, and and the the size of it um, is 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 very expensive. So I guess the, you know when we when we saw that come through Friday, we're we're like thinking, and then we're talking budget. What what do we really want? What are we going to do? Um, so for instance, we're looking at doing the the playground and the and the stadium where KPM bids. Well over hundred grand. So is yeah, so is that again, is that if we're right away today we talked about we need to we need to get some more prices. So Scott's already made two contacts um, to try to get some more prices just to see if we're within close or close. Uh, we did get a we did get a bid for the was it was paid to the playground? No, that was the the parking area. The parking area. Yeah. yeah. So Again, and again, they were just estimates, so I'd hate to share those numbers, yeah. and we're going to put it out the bid. No. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, we have to kind of figure it is, it to do both areas, it's going to be, in my opinion, probably out of our budget. So we may want to piecemeal this, do some this year, maybe some next year. Do it, you know, it's... Uh, and one smaller portions. I'd ask you to get those bids at least in three parts: one for the elementary, one for one side of ADA parking, and the third for the other side of ADA parking. That way, it gives us options for one, two, one, two, or all three, based on whatever those bids come back. I say bid, or you got these were just estimates. You didn't hear quotes. You got just phone quotes. So we have what? Well, we have one what? quote for what? the parking, and yeah, we have we one. Had Bid, which is because it's your KPN. Yeah. Right, so it actually is a bid. It's a true bid. Or the playground, elementary playground. Your own That's all we have. Because the problem is, and I, stop me when I screw this up, <laughs> or I go too far, because I'm good at going too far. The, for the, the KPN, low bar company, would like some type of engineering drawings, architectural drawings, beyond what we have now, to give a bid for the parking at the stadium. So they, without they, those drawings, won't give us the information. Yeah, they were not comfortable giving us a price for the parking with what we what we had. But they were comfortable giving us a playground right. bid, and it's completely legal and meets all of our needs, and it's good until December 31st, 2024, which is also a positive for us, so we have plenty of time, but um, yeah. the so, cost was surprised to me. So... so when do when does it need to be bid versus phone quotes versus? Uh, it's about twenty three thousand dollars roughly. So okay. so basically anything under just just for average numbers, don't quote me specifically. About twelve thousand under, nothing's required between twelve thousand and twenty two twenty three. It's it's that zone. That is three quotes, and they can be telephone or yeah. written. And then anything over say twenty three thousand, it's it's some change. Right. And formal quotes and or bids. So, so bids. we can get we can get the quotes. And we only have to go to a formal bid process over if our quotes, if none of our quotes are under that threshold. Or okay, that's the only time it's required to go. Okay. Yes. And then just to remember, for, especially for newer board members, the, the general gist is we need a bid spec, you know, a project with some type of rating rubric or you know evaluation tool. Usually say rubric, and then has to be advertised. It takes 21 days minimum um, to you know, put it in newspapers and. And it collects sealed bids for the project. We can do it however we, you know, you, it's fine if you do it with three different parts. If we did one parking area, maybe under that threshold, that's just your quotes. 
we did one point. That'd probably be cool. If we did them both, I would say we'd have to put out the pin. Yeah. If we did the if we did the playground, that's going to have to go up. That's just a big area. So I'm not familiar with these areas. I don't know. How big of an area are you talking with? Yeah. The parking areas are six spots. Um, six spots. Yeah, six yeah. spots. And it's six and six, so 12 total. There's so there'll, be, there'll be some, two some excavating, but six, there are six handicap spots. Okay. Down so within in range of the, the playground. Stadium. What's that? Uh, that's uh, a lot of paving. That's yeah, that's, of, that's just kind of an overlay of what what's there already. So um, some overlay and some connected and some added. Yeah, yeah, some added. Yeah. So I understand with the playground, it was more of a muddy area, whatever you want to. Well, and uneven surfaces. Uneven, yeah, uneven surfaces. Uh, but that's hazard. there now, just there. Uh, no, well, it's McAdam that's there now. Yeah, there's some. So some, some, some there of the now. project would be overlay, some of it would be new. Yeah. Yeah. We put down with a base, but some of it would be an overlay. So, what is that used for? It's actually oh yeah, like it's heavily yeah. used. Yeah. Okay. Heavily used. They were out there today. I mean, it's heavily used, and in a good way. It's it's a it's a big release for the kiddos. No, I don't. Says, I, yeah. just, oh yeah. Just I mean, a K to, K to four playground time in all grade levels. K to four, and like this time of year, obviously, uh, hopefully there's knock on whatever. Hopefully there's no more snow. But this time of year, if we have snow, trying to have everything cleared so we can get the kids outside to at least stay on the blacktop. Uh, so the one area. Uh, that was put in would be a walkway that would connect all of the paved areas at the playground. So kind of just more space to have the kids. It would make a loop. It, it would. It would make it be a big circle, kind of basically, is what it would do, if if that would be a possibility. Uh, and it would just create you know a little bit more more space uh, for the kids to be able to move. Specifically when we have snow or it's just like. Sunday, we got all the rain on Saturday. Things are a muddy mess. Uh, would be nice if it's a possibility. Anybody look for ADA grants of any sort? These are this is increasing accessibility is the whole approach here. And well, there 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 is there is a grant that we have. It's uh and he he actually Curtis talked about it. Open up much first. It's a uh, facilities type of grant. It's competitive. It's through the state. Uh, there's hundred million dollars uh, being ran through the state. Right? <laughs> I would be all right. And the <laughs> generator too. The state. <laughs> so you think hundred million dollars? Well, that's a lot of money. But when you're starting to think about uh, school district in Philadelphia, school district in Harrisburg, school district in Erie, school district in Pittsburgh, you know. So oh, we, we, we like, as just like this competitive safety grant, I applied for it. Um, We'll see what we get. Um, I think this is some something we can put in, put in for it as well. When is the determination for this grant? September. Wait, no, no, no. You have to have it in by May. They'll be signed in September. So and you can't sign a contract until they decide, which, yeah. is, which makes sense. Yeah, so September. So again, that you know, may not. Well, so you can't use the grant retroactively for projects. Why? Well, I, I this asked that one. today. Not for this one. My my. Understanding and reading the grant was no, and I asked them, listen, because I'm thinking, can we pay for the sport project? And the answer is no. Yeah, so that was good. That's the right question. So, and one, one thing that would help me financially, I know we need more numbers and then we're not being completely transparent on purpose because if someone rewatches this video, they could get numbers and then, you know, just quote that or did that. We don't. We would prefer it to be open and honest sitting, of course, so we don't say those numbers publicly. But, you know, I think Mr. Hogan said about, you know, A and B being the stadium parking, six stalls, six stalls, and then C is the playground. And the playground kind of has two or three different options, or, you know, kind of the main option and then the additional pathway. And, and another, there's kind of six things on the table, so to speak. Now, remember, one of the things with the playground is, you know, you, you can't just say, well, you know, this is 10 and this is 10 and this is 10. I'm going to do them, you know, a and then six months later B and then six months later C. It won't remain ten because of staging and other you know kind of base concepts, right? So that's something that's important to discuss. Just like over here, if you're gonna have one contractor do A and B, you're gonna save a little bit of money because they're doing one staging. Am I right about that, mm -hmm. Scott? Yeah. But it also increases the cost. So and I guarantee you, 
and I would not bring you a proposal to do all five concepts because I don't think that's how we, we're not ready to spend that kind of money. We have other needs that probably outweigh all five options. However, you know, maybe we do pick something. So if the board has a specific, like we really want this one versus this one, I, we still need to get pricing to you guys for everything. We need to be open eyes to you guys. But, you know, if somebody has really gone wrong, like, okay, we think this is the bigger need, um, we'll, we'll focus on that even more so. But we're going to focus on all of it. But direction from you guys is always helpful to me. Which, which project would be the most beneficial? That's the most value. That's what I'm kind of asking. There. They're all sounds, valuable. It sounds yeah. to me like you need more for the playground. The then. playground does have a big impact on... on Four, five grade levels. The stadium has a big impact on folks that have mobility concerns and, and ADA. So I think we have good schematics of what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, at stadium, uh -huh. if you have similar schematics or the concepts for the playground, you could share with us in an email. That would be. Do they provide schematics? Got it. I mean, they do. Not, not so specific as. Yes. Josh well, it wasn't nearly as nice. It's just to the be broader strokes, just understanding what the different things we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, so are you getting a quote for the playground? You can just ask for. Well, if I'm going to have somebody, then I'm going to have them look at all. That'll help us compare apples to apples. Yeah, the three options. Even if you just have a satellite image and they're all on it, that's what it looks like. That we have. That that that's kind of what they gave us. Yeah. At the school board. Yeah, that's fine. Yours is very detailed. <laughs> Thank you. Like you know something about surveying and civil engineering. I hope so. Is that update? There is no update. Is that the gist of that meeting? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So oh, you're up two B. Yeah. Okay. So we're moving on. So two B, um, the Northumberland County reassessment update. Um, right. Basically, Northumberland County needs. So they had a public meeting. Um, to kind of get the pulse of the their community. Obviously, we only have one taxing, which is Ralpho in Northumberland County. Um, the notes are all there, but basically they have no money budgeted for this whatsoever. It's a three-year minimum process, and for us, you know, if this happened, uh, we probably wouldn't see any change until 23rd. Um, and the only change we would see, basically, First of all, the mills in Northumberland County would go down because the assessments would go up and you net the same dollars. Northumberland County, Ralph for us, brings us about $4 million in real estate taxes. It's a little more than $4 million. Um, so, you know, basically when they reassess the whole county, if they went through with it, they would say, okay, well, you know, your new mills are going to be, you know, 13 and that's going to equal your $4 million because of the reassessment. The problem for the school district is this, is any... So, this, so we're odd because the other school districts that are entirely in Northumberland County have greater risk than we do. But we still have risk. And here's what our risk is, and I know some of you really like to think through these pieces, is appeals. So let's say, for instance, that there is a large commercial business in that municipality that's ours. And you know, they reset the mills and they say, well, we're not valued at that. And they appeal and they win their appeal. We simply lose that money. And the county, their big broad scopes like, oh, okay, that's just a little bit of money. But for us, it's more important because it's micro that are being macro. Um, so you know, I have to look at how many parcels are in that particular taxing authority, but you know, I want to say it's less than three thousand. So the biggest concern we have would be appeals. That would be the concern. Beyond that, then, in 2030, you would have um, home price sales may be adjusted by this because now the homes are actually valued correctly, they're assessed correctly. You know, that, that would change possibly the price of homes being sold. The real estate transfer tax could be impacted, possibly negatively. And then the only other thing is when we rebalance. So see, all the other school districts don't really know rebalancing because they're only in one county. As you know, we have six municipalities in Columbia and then Ralph and Northumberland. So once we settle our budget, we say this is our goal. Once we do that, then we go through the process of rebalancing and ensuring that it's not going to say equal, the technical PDE word is equitable, between the two, six and the one, Columbia County and Northumberland County. 
when those once we set our goal for taxation and, and revenue generation they have to rebalance that's why last year if you notice Northumberland County was like really 1.8 and Columbia County was closer to 2 you know, they, they were not the same that's because of rebalancing this is a lot of words to say it's six years out till it really impacts us if it even happens and I'm not sure whether Northumberland County should come up with four million dollars I have concern there and I and the school districts every school district was there which was good and every school district said who pays for that and they, the commissioners were smart they said not you <laughs> they said we're not paying for this um, obviously you know certain municipalities and school districts in the county want it but there is some opposition um, because when they, when they do this some homes will, well they said call the rule of thirds a third will pay more a third will pay less and a third will stay the same either way you made two-thirds of the people mad because if you stayed the same, you're mad because you didn't go down. And if you went up, you're mad because you're going up. You got to think about that. The people that stay the same still get mad because their neighbors may pay less. And they're the ones that are electing the county. That's a good point. That's a good point. So, and this has been a topic apparently for years in Nevada County. I didn't know that. It's been a while. And and they have the um, the CLR factor. I think Nevada County is like a 10.8, which is really horrible. Uh, the closer you are to 100 means the closer your assessed values are being accurate. There's 10 point something. I think it's 10, 10.4 or 10.8. So like meaning that what the homes are selling for versus what they're assessed at are 90% off. <laughs> that's pretty bad. If but they were all 90% off, then it would be fair just at a wrong value. The problem right. is if a newer home gets assessed and they take it from market value that day down to 10.8, Right. That's why people think that, okay, well, it's out of whack and we should redo the whole thing. Correct. It's like a great system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of answer did they give you is where the rat was? Oh, yes. So, uh, they said Ralpho is, they have two assessors and they will always be behind forever. However, <laughs> a, a Ralpho is very current because they did a big sweep October, November, December and scooped up a lot of properties. And I'll tell you, they did because we sent interim bills here. And I apologize for that, but we send in our own bills. And I looked uh, two years ago in the County was less than 20. Last year it was less than 20. This year it was 134 or something like that. So, I mean, you know, to go from 20, 20 to 130. Now, here's the thing. And, and I get phone calls and, and please always contact me. But they're like, you know, I, I don't want this. And I'm like, I get it. But it, here it is. And, um, you know, they say, well, you know, People often will say to me, well, I did it here, and you didn't build me here, and you're missing this period. I'm like, right, don't tell me that, because that was your grace period. That's the time that we didn't get the information, so you got three upgrades. And they're like, oh, it's interesting to see the light bulb light. Have a nice day, click, and because um, they don't want me to reassess them with even more money. Now, we legally can't do that, but the concept is they got a time period because the assessors are so far behind. They're not really backdating those. When they get to them, they're getting to them. The other thing is they're very clear that they cannot assess or reassess just because they want to. There needs to be action, permits or other, you know, avenues. It's not just like they're driving around looking. Um, the permits are the biggest piece. Is there any benefit to us for them doing this? Is there a benefit to whom? The district. To the school district for them doing a reassessment. For the countywide reassessment? Yeah. Not really. There's none. There's, there's only not, risk. There's, there's no risk. Benefit. The risk is appeals. Right. So there's there's a downside risk, but there's no upside risk for them. We net the same dollars. Right. If Ralpo happened to be a municipality in the county that generally had more assessments go up, then there would, that would be benefit upside. us. It's a detriment of our it would only benefit us in the future. It would not benefit the us the first year because the first year right. resets to zero. That's what I mean. Like so it doesn't benefit us in not that way one. because it resets our millage. Right. To match so that there's sure. no change, and then the only way it benefits us is if we raise taxes. So it doesn't. There's there's no. Well, there's no way to it does district. The only thing, Josh, is that they thing. can keep up on new construction. Right, but that has nothing to do with the reassessment. Right. Yeah, right? like so the reassessment. The reassessment is just a cost that isn't going to gain. So it, it benefits. No. It benefits certain. It redistributes the taxation. What they call right. the fair The reason that some cities or towns are pushing for it is because well so some people are overpaying 
there's other reasons there. So I don't want to. That's what they publicly said. That's what they, I mean. I believe they were going to add limits and they could add their. Well, so that's true. Their actual so for us, what happens is if our bills go one. down, our Act One index, then your available increases become less. Because right now we're at seven. So it actually is even more detrimental to us. It will cap our. If we were at some max millage, if we were at some some you know this is your maximum millage that you can do, and we were right there at that threshold, then reassessing would lower the mills that we are right you know, that we are it would raising more to get the same amount, and then we would have more headroom to raise taxes further. But in any case, the only way it benefits us is, is the board. Raising taxes, and we're not against a limit. We're not raising taxes because <laughs> really we're trying not to raise taxes, not because we can't. All right. <laughs> so it doesn't help us. Yeah, and here's the thing: the so statute is only if you live in Ralphwood, you can get a vote for this. If you, you know, yeah. you have to live in a federal county to vote the commissioners in and out. And pointless. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned the district standpoint, the there's no, capital, there's no benefit from this at all. I, I would say no. There's no. There's little, if they ask for opinion, we don't want it. We think this is crazy and shouldn't waste seven million dollars on a reassessment. I, that's our know. opinion, yes. I like it. I'm going to the news item. Say, if you have a meeting with them again, is trying to stress the point that they get their new construction. Yeah. And I'll say this we had a meeting with Andy yeah. County, yeah. and they actually yeah. hired a guy to go out and catch the all of the last items for the last district. item where you're oh. saying no thermal zone. Yeah. I think yeah. the new green. The Thumb County is not certainly the draft. It will be so based on the new value revenue to be yeah. equal to zero. It's a drop from from the absolutely, they're, and they're losing it on the county. The, 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 the problem for the reassessment is the county looks at it as a whole, and we only look at it as one part. And I don't think we're the smallest part. <laughs> Catch on the $11,000 sound system. It's oh, yeah. Very rosy compared to. No, no, no. See, yeah, see. So here's the catch. The catch is that, that Scott and I put it in. <laughs> I said, that's the catch. Hey, you got, I, I told you I wanted the sound system, but I figure it out, okay? And, and here's my solution. So I, I come here from another school district, and they recently installed one of these. And we recently hired a food service director who comes from that district, and he was a I don't know if he was paid or volunteer, but he was a football coach there. And I said, oh, my gosh. And my wife's classroom overlooks the field. And I said, hey, so let's get information. I said, actually, John said this to me. Of course, you should get their information. So here it is, $11,389. So here's the thing. That's under the, the, the quote threshold. So we now know that it's at least less than that. Um, this is literally like we could get this in a couple weeks. It's going to be $25,000 budgeted. We would need a little bit of conduit. We'd need a couple hours of Scott's time and his, his people. And uh, they already gave us a diagram. Put it in these places, put it at these angles, plugs into the wall. Um, it's supposed to do what we need. Um, uh, it has Bluetooth, it has two microphones, one wireless, one wired with push to talk. Um, it would have two zones, which is nice. You'd have a zone for the bleachers right in front of the press box. You can control that volume. And then you have to the outside for kind of the other side, and you would you probably turn that one up a little bit more in volume. And you wanted a solution, and I was like, well, no, here, I wanted to present you a solution. <laughs> Let me be clear. I like this idea. Like I think it's a great idea. I want to go. I'm so proud of our athletics. And I'm so proud of our stadium. But then when I go there and I can't understand the announcer as a sound guy, it bothers me. $150,000 bothers me. $75,000 bothers me. Eleven thousand in Scott's time and my time. I'm on board with that. Here's the reality of this, right? Eleven thousand bucks doesn't work. We'll find a place to put it, <laughs> but uh, or we'll return it. Um, but Midwest has this exact system. Um, I've heard it, and I was like, that's pretty good for eleven thousand bucks. Now again, no installation. We would do it on our own time, like here. But Chris Snyder found the bee's knees for eleven thousand dollars. Is anybody opposed to letting our sounds? I mean, it's already people? budgeted. Well, so since it's in 32, I need your permission. <laughs> right, but we already but this That's is, the catch. This has been this current year. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't even be asking. <laughs> no, no, no. We're asking. We're asking. You guys are like, hey, I'll check out the new style system. Like, a lot of hot dogs. Okay? A lot of hot dogs. <laughs> We did a fundraiser. I, well, I mean, hey, I just, I, I've been trying to, this has been on my brain. It needs to be done. I mean, I, you, agree? you okay. can't hear it. I mean, right. it's, it's terrible. So Do we, we need to vote then to move that? Or you just, you, you don't need to vote. You just need, I just need to record it that you say yes. So, so yeah. two things happened. We budgeted 25000 last year. Yep. So 
that's covered, and then it frees up twenty five thousand in this year's budget that we're going to be. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I took it out yet, but if but we can, yes, we can reallocate it or delete it or whatever we want to do with it. Correct. Yeah, we would no longer need to fund that project because it would be paid for. That to me sounds. And it gets thirteen grand back for this year. Twenty five percent. So that is reserve money, um, technically allotted to fields. So I would put, I would recommend keep it in the turf yeah. field. Agreed. Fund, agree. which is fund thirty five. Or is it 33? Excuse me, 33. 32 is general, 33 is turf, 35 is low tech. So, just so our new members know, we were ultimately budgeting about 50, 25 over two years, which was still way more than we really wanted to, but this is super awesome number compared to what we thought it was going to be. So, well, I think Mr. Roosevelt. impact that on this upcoming year's budget. Was like budget. Yeah, when, yeah, when John said, he goes, Chris, I know Midwest spent like 12 grand. I was like, oh, I'm in Foco. <laughs> yeah. So we tried to get Midwest old system when they threw it away. And Seals Grove still. Seals Grove. And they threw it the other way. Seals Grove put theirs in the dumpster. It's a new state. Oh, Seals Grove. Seals Grove, yeah. Well, Midwest had one too, and they told me you didn't want it. <laughs> and is there any a board member opposed to 11,389? Nope. Have fun. Yeah. We are going to have fun. We're going to play some good yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, exactly. So. Yeah. Why don't we do E quick and then, so E is maintenance of effort letter. So you can look through that just basically we are required to uh, do maintenance of effort, which simply means that we're spending similar dollars for similar academic programs. If you have a big variance, you have to justify it. Um, we have had to justify this in the past. We are doing better, um, I think, with recording our transactions and being <coughs> transparent. Um, so we have a clean letter, which is fantastic, and these are the kind of letters we want. So I just want to update you guys. This, these kind of, yeah. I mean, this is something we do a lot. Like in my office, nice we're looking at these things. Add a boy. Thank you. And then F is the monthly invoices. I have them all right here. If you have any questions, let me know. You can email them or, or ask them whatever you have. Um, any fund, any, any invoice questions that are in the box. Um, so then D is the only other option. And I, I know we have the principals here. Thank you for coming. Um, we continue to be basically, you know, the salary increase is right around 2.7. Benefits are, are similar. We have the 5% inflation built into most areas. We've lowered Columbia, Ontario Tech to 2.3% as presented earlier. That is in the budget and has been in the budget correctly. Um, and then if you scroll down just a little bit, so for discussion, again, we just need to keep thinking about the solar project inflows and outflows. Uh, we will be, you know, dropping $910,000 on them in the next 30 days because that's the 30% down. Um, and then the ag program, we've been talking about that. And then, you know, staffing, um, we need to keep thinking about levels of teachers and, and what we need and what's best for us and for our students. Um, so those, those are kind of, that's not, staffing isn't on there, but that's a new piece that's kind of coming up. Currently 91 kindergarten registrations. So that's what I'm hoping it's attributed the larger number is attributed to us publicizing um, the, so that, the uh, registration process at a greater level. Um, so well, that's what we're going to have 105 in September. What was the estimated one? What's that? What was estimated? Oh, I actually have 93. Do you remember what the PDE estimate was? That number keeps growing. I thought the PDE number was 93. So then so PDE is going to be low because we definitely so, have more kids yeah, to come. Like, some... Over the past years, it's usually almost at, what, 10, 15 percent higher than what we usually get registered here in the spring? Yeah, about 15. Yeah, so so about another hours. 14, that, that gets you hope, a 107. What I'm hopeful is, is not, we, we've but... really um, publicized that maybe we capture more than this year, so we're hoping to capture more, that there won't be a big influx this summer to kindergarten registration. At the bottom, Jim, is there an Excel spreadsheet at the bottom? Yeah, because there is. Okay, yeah, would you click on it, Mr. Becker, please? And you have to enable editing. Now, for you guys, I'll give you the uh, Excel version. If it's to a person who requests it, I give them a PDF. So, um, so, like right now, we're looking at 19 kids for kindergarten class. Yep. Figure out 20. So I had asked Chris to reach out to our principals and ask them to attend this month just in case any of you have any input, any potential cost savings, or if you're looking saying, I need more, um, to give you guys a chance to interact with us directly on the budget before it's like totally said and done. So, um, 
Well, more or less. I think we're at a good spot. The only request of a substantial amount that was brought to my attention was from our tech ed department as far as a band saw. There's a type of band saw out there now. As soon as it makes contact with flesh or skin, it just shuts down immediately. Ty advised them to start saving money in their personal budget. But, you know, it is a safety, you know, safety mechanism that, you know, we should think about. So, you know, maybe, you know, I know there's some extra tools and stuff in there that we had talked about. Maybe we can sell off some of those old tools in order to recoup some money for that. But I think they said the total might be, I think it was roughly around $12,000. So that, I advised them to, you know, start saving their money in the budget. And, you know, we can have a further discussion once I brought it to your attention. So to piggyback on that, sometimes bad news, right, is we did just spend quite a bit of money on their plane, which they need. And we save money because we get rough cut lumber and they need plane and planing is an important skill. You know, so I get it. But it's, you know, tech has a tough program because it has a lot of machinery. We did also do a preventive maintenance this year, which was fantastic. We spent it right out of the budget. So it was not an extra cost. But we had a company come in. I forget the name of the company. But they did a good, would you agree, Scott, when they came in, they did? Yeah, they went through all the machines and made sure they were safe. So we did do some preventative maintenance this year already, which I thought was excellent and within the budget. So it wasn't expended. Now that table, the planer was completely out of the budget, just so we're clear. We spent the money, but it was not budgeted for. And that was, the planer was broken, though, and we couldn't get replacement parts. Oh, I agree. Yeah, it was necessary. So the thing, you know, so we did overspend this year. I guess here's the question, right? Because the other thing is, you know, are they more concerned about the bandsaw breaking or being a safety? Safety. Okay. Yeah. As I say, eventually it'll break. No matter what you do, eventually it will be replaced. Well, that's really brought to my attention from a safety aspect. And then also in the high school, I would say the auditorium, we just have some needs maybe for some enhancements, we'll say, specific to safety. A couple clamps and some things that just need to be buttoned up, and we're going to look into some options for that. But that's not really instructional, or that would be outside of your budget. Right. Yeah, no. I mean, we have plenty left. Like, we're in a good spot, so I won't need any extra. So I'm ready to go. Where did we end up with the discussion on the stage in the auditorium? So we had a company come look at it. We're going to meet with Ms. Williams here after the show to go over some things. There's some safety items. There's some pictures of certain clamps or some things that need to be fixed. Almost, they look original type of things. So we're going to work on some of that stuff. I think there was a quote for... You really want to say it, Jim? You don't want to say it. You always tell me I overshare. Go ahead. I want to hear it. We're looking at doing a bid or anything like that. Don't give numbers. Okay. So let's just say it's tall. Yeah. Just like a curtain replacement was huge, huge, huge. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. But so there's some things that we need to take care of this summer. And there are some things that long are wish lists that we can maybe look at in the future. They're more than the stadium sounds. Oh, are you progressing with the locker room? Well, we got some. Yeah, I got one quote and I'm waiting on two more quotes. I was pleased with the first quote, though. I was pleased with the quote. Yeah, I was surprised that that was in a good way. That quote surprised me to positive. It's a locker room quote range. Auditorium bid range. Auditorium bid range plus. Did we figure out, is the stage all underneath? Is there, or is that at ground level under the stage? The stage has a compartment underneath where it's got, you can go. Yes, it is. It has bracing. Yeah. I've never been under there, so it's like. Well, just as that progresses, my initial request was if we have to do something like give me the make it safe, give me the make it somewhat better, and hey, it'd be really nice because if we replaced all the seating, got additional seating, and lowered the stage and did everything just right, we could use it for a lot more. I'd entertain that. 
How many people? Maybe not based on what you're saying anymore. But the capacity was, what would you tell me the capacity is 483? 483. Yes, four. <clears throat> Which probably makes sense with the size of our facility. Right. Yeah. Do they think any kind of major renovations in that auditorium will be major dollars? Well, I'm thinking bond. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking if you really, if we really want to do it, I don't, I don't. I'm just saying. I mean, I apologize. If that's not what you want to hear, but I think that's the truth. Well, remember the sound system was cut by about six fold. I got it. Yeah. Out, so I don't, I don't have friends everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think between us though we do. I think between us we do. So middle school, um, Mr. Kiefer has. How's the budget for this year looking? I know, you know, we're... Uh, yeah, we just kept the status quo with where it was. <clears throat> Obviously, one of my main concerns, and I know we have the extra money and, and things, but the after-school programming and the additional help for students, um, you know, something along those lines to make sure it's sustainable from year to year. I always feel like it's dependent upon money, monies that may or may not be available at the time. <laughs> And um, I know that was a main concern, you know, parents reaching out saying they got the after school tutoring, the homework help, um, you know, those kinds of things. So it, that, that's something to consider down the road, um, you know, the investment to sustain those programs after school, I think is a good thing, um, you know, but with it comes cost. And I know that we want to provide equity to all of our students. So is it always feasible for transportation? Those things, you know, it goes up exponentially when you start adding those things. Uh, so, uh, that, you know, that's one thing. I also have passed the um, P the SMART, the PTO um, Association, um, to look into some programming. You know, free programming is one thing, but find ways that our, our middle school students can get more experiences. And uh, so we're looking into fundraising opportunities and different ways to, to build those for next year. Um, so, yeah, otherwise, I guess the other little thing, subtle thing, and I know it bothers me, um, but, you know, some of the areas outside the entryway of the middle school, you know, more beautification, but some of the blocks chipping and the rebar is showing and, and um, you know, there's certain things there. Um, I mean, that, I mean, that would be nice, so, you know, especially we're opening campus up. We have families, parents. We invite the community on campus. I think there's certain things. Um, that we could maybe do to, to enhance that, you know. I wonder if Columbia Monterey would take us some masonry kits to come down. I wonder. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's crazy it's just the way where the block is chipped. It's like the block is just crumbling. It's of no fault of anybody. It, it's uh, you know I don't know if it's substandard material or what, but it, it's um, you know there's certain like the corners of, of certain like areas freezing and, and it's just chipping away. And every time I take the kiddos out to the to the baseball field, there's you know piles of it right there <laughs> where, where it chipped earlier that morning. So you say brick? That's yeah, block. I'm not block. really sure what it is. It's uh, just it's a facade, facade maybe. maybe. It's, the concrete, it's, it's, it's where the railing is attaching to the concrete ramp. Okay. It, it, it was, it, it must have been patched before I was here and the patches are just blowing out and, and falling apart. It, it was just, to me, it was a bad design. Like that whole ramp area, the step should have been under cover. Yeah, should have had a room. I mean, we, we, when we, in the, in the winter time, it, it gets a lot of salt put on it, you know, with gel and whatever. Um, and that's definitely havoc with concrete on film. Um, so the after school program, so they currently covered with the ESSER learning loss money. Uh, yeah. Basically, and this is it, but September 30th, 2024, and that money will be gone before then. Um, all ESSER dollars will be completely spent by September 30th, 2024. So we have staff helping with the homework help this spring, and not just student tutor. Well, uh, we we have the student the, the mentoring program, and, and it's a free program if we have students assist at some point in the day. And so we tried to build that a little more, knowing that that money's gonna gonna dry up. Um, and at the time right now, we're kind of working together and building a pro, you know, something for the remainder of the school year. Um, I know at least for my numbers, I think I had two um, teach, uh, staff members that were willing to in ELA and math, and I think you have at least probably two. Um, and I know Brandon, you probably have some staff members as I well. I had six that, that said that they would do it. 
which is good. I think there's a much higher need probably there. Um, but yeah, so we do have, we're going to have a plan at least for the remainder of the year, but uh, you know, it just would be nice if it was something that was established every year, you know, we could advertise it, we could get staff right at the beginning of the school year and, uh, and, and just kind of sustain this program. But I know it's going to cost money to do that. Jim, I had asked last year for Stephanie to collect data at the end of the homework help day to help demonstrate the positive impact of the teachers so that they would be willing to offer this extra time um, and to just kind of demonstrate to everybody that it was worth the investment. Do we know if that exists anywhere? I have not seen it. I mean, I can say I have all the attendance data, but I don't have anything beyond it. Yeah, I mean, sort of like look at grades, like mm, and improvements, mm -hmm. yeah. trends. Because I thought it was a really good thing, and I thought that would be a really good way to quantify it to get. You know, I do have a list of every child that attended, and um, you know how many times they attend, because ESSER requires us to report that to the federal government. But beyond that, they don't require any outcomes. Right. Just, just looking at that as a local. Yeah. So the deeper dive would be into the out the improvement or. or not a token or change or not change. So, I mean, it probably we can look like again, there's files and stuff and see if we can find something. If you reach out to me, if you know who's in it, we do know who was, we do, we do know the students' names, yes. You could look at their work more for very great structure. Absolutely, we could. But I would check with Stephanie first to see if it exists in her email somewhere before you. Sure, we started. created. Anything else for Mr. Kiefer? Mr. Trot, um, thoughts on, um, because you, you've had the middle school budget for a while and now you have the elementary budget, which is different, looks different. Um, thoughts for, you know, how it's going? Uh, so obviously not looking at staffing, just looking at my my building supply budget things, uh, keeping it the same. I know Chris is proposing a small increase there, uh, looking historically back at it over the last four or five years. It's been decreasing. Obviously, uh, I don't know what the theory was behind that. Uh, obviously, with inflation uh, and, and just prices of everything else going up, I am not looking to decrease the elementary budget uh, at all. Uh, so, same status quo there. I agree with everything Mike said about establishing an after school program. Uh, you know, there's neighboring districts around us that, that offer it, uh, you know, yearly. Obviously, the big thing is, especially middle school, elementary, parents might want their kids to stay, and they might see the great need and benefit for it. But if we don't offer transportation, that that's uh, the, the, the downfall. Of getting those kids to stay and getting them the help that they probably need uh, whether it's homework help or like remediation help working on their own individual skill sets uh, that they need to increase uh, in math and ELA. so so that's uh, you know definitely something that to, to focus on there uh, from a staffing perspective uh, I, I believe when mr. Becker and I talked about this uh, Somebody, might have been Mr. Hoagland, mentioned this a couple, maybe the January board meeting, I do believe uh, we need to add a, a regular ed teacher in the elementary for next year. I think our numbers justify that uh, with where our third grade and fourth grade numbers will be. Uh, and I know that's a that's a big cost, obviously. And that's uh, not in the budget. The thing on the screen does not include that. But uh, I think this is a conversation to have now, uh, compared to last school year, I get to the elementary in July, and I'm like, <laughs> where are these numbers at in third grade? Uh, and we, you know, rush around to hire somebody in August uh, for the start of the school year two weeks later. Uh, so. My perspective is, my stance is, is, is we need to add, add a teacher there. Uh, and I think our numbers right now justify throughout the, the elementary, staying where we're at and add, adding one there. Uh, maybe in the future, then maybe there'll be some room to 
you know, fluctuate and move, move things around, some uh, retirements and things of that nature coming up. So the discussion so, was was moving or that was so that yeah, we're, we're still in process. So we're looking. I don't. I don't believe there's the opportunity to move to the elementary school because the numbers are if that threshold numbers to by if we took if we went from four to uh, from five to four, um, the numbers in the lower grades would be too high. I think there are there is a. a Somewhere third, fourth, fifth grade where you go, it's it's better to raise numbers in classes. Not great. Um, I don't think we can take one from the elementary school somewhere, like take a second grade teacher and move it because the because of numbers being low. I don't think that's going to happen. I do think we were in process of evaluating everything, K twelve, and seeing where. It, we can shift. I don't have an answer for you with that. We're still looking at stuff. Henry's going to be doing uh, some some uh, and 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 Mike doing some scheduling. So we'll have some numbers as we go over the next one. But we'll we'll probably we definitely have to have somewhat of an idea again before May when we approve this budget where we're going to go. Here. Well, I think in, in May. I need. Mean, I think we need it before May. Uh, because if we're looking at hiring someone, I don't want to be advertising in June or July right. and getting someone that has been turned down by several other places. So, uh, so oh, sorry, go. Go, go, go ahead. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> our uh, course selection window is going to open that first <laughs> week in April, so we'll be able to start getting tallies for students for what classes they signed up for, so then we'll get a better idea. <laughs> At that point, I think we can realistically get you a favorable idea by the April meeting. Yeah. And well, I'm saying we're going to do that. that showcase too. Right? The showcase. That's that's the week. Before. Ideally, it would be yeah. to. I think that's good. I don't know when May. we advertise to have a deadline the end of April. In my opinion, to be able to interview in May to be able to hire at the May board meeting. And you can put anticipated opening, right? Because then... Well, if you hadn't approved the budget, that's how you, you would need to list it. Yeah. So this is not like a different situation. We're in this gray zone in the budget cycle where we've almost reached the point where you have to talk about staffing, but you don't have to put your retirement on paper till April 15th. So there might be lots of thoughts about what could happen, but really they can't start moving those puzzle pieces around until that time. So I agree with Brandon. I see the need with adding the fifth, fourth grade teacher. I'm less concerned about the total impact on our budget. Like, that doesn't scare me because I think there's other moving parts potentially that we'll have to wait and see what happens. We can't do anything until really April. Sure. We can hone the rest of it down, but until April, we can't wait. Right. Is fourth grade another one of those they teen teach? Yeah. So then you'll have just that fifth class, the standalone classroom, like, like third grade is now. Well, third third grade. Yeah, whenever the whenever there was five teachers, obviously think, that would be better. Okay. I'll go back. There's been different ways of doing it. There's been someone where the teams have worked together and then the fifth one was self contained, but there's been others where they rotated that fifth person in. So there's ways to do both. I think just the decision on what's self best. So just just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, did you guys see this okay? No, it was a glare. Um, right, it was a glare. So basically, the column C is the let's just talk revenue because we just kind of spent a lot of time on expenses. Thank you. So revenue, we need to drive all of our expenditures with revenue. One way to think about it. So fund what we're going to spend. So when you're looking at column C for the preliminary budget, which eventually becomes the you know proposed budget and then the final budget. The select rate here, you can change this. It's a drop down. It gives you the different options for millage increases. Now, obviously, they're kind of set, you know, 0 0.05 increments. So, you know, we could plug in more, but they're kind of set that way. So, as you select one here, for instance, our max is the 6.9%. You know, 6 if you went to the max, that would raise $651,000 based on our current real estate taxes of our seven municipalities. Now, for many of you, this is a review, but if not, and then you can come all the way down and just scroll down and take it down, for instance, a 1%, and then 94000 So the, the one 
great thing about receiving just under $10 million is that, you know, 1% bumps 100K, 2%, you know, you can just a little slightly under, you know, you kind of use some rounding there. And then the $5.5 million is EIT, other taxes, interest, et cetera, those kind of things. You know, so that's, we've been slowly creeping that up and making that be, I think, more appropriate. And then the state revenue, $10 million here. Now, what's important to note is our base. So of the basic education funding, our base will not change unless the legislature changes. So we are guaranteed to get $4.3 million. That's our exact base. It will not change. And the same thing with special ed, $762,000. Those are our base numbers. They are not impacted. They do not go up or down. They're locked in. When the state says, oh, we're going to give more money to education, the only way we get more money is through the formula. There is a basic ed formula. That's this line here. And there's a special education formula, that line there. So notice on the special ed formula, you know, we received $220,000 this year. I'm only suggesting that we're going to receive two twenty-five. dollars Now, sources say that that's low, that that number will be higher, but it has to be approved. This and it year, gets approved in August, September. Well, this year, it wasn't finished till December. December. <laughs> we got the numbers in, in basically September, October, but they didn't give it to us till December. That's the other thing, too. Just because they're going to give you the money, you have to also receive the money. You have to use the appropriations to get all the bills through and, and distribute the funds. Now, with basic ed funding, this year we're in right now, we got $1.029 million. I'm going up to $1.054. Obviously, that could be low, especially with the governor's proposal. It's a huge proposal, but it's just a proposal. We need to approve our budget long before the state ever approves theirs. On Friday, I got to sit with PDE with about 200 other business managers. <laughs> Tony was there, and Tony Lila. And um, it was a great session, but they said, be ready for a dog fight, and it's going to be challenging, and you're not going to be a lot of unknowns. You will be required to pass your budget before the state does it. And they also, here's what they recommended. I, I don't like this. PDE themselves recommended flat funding. I said, why would I do that? Because they're going to raise local taxes and then to balance my budget. They're like, or use fund balance. But EDE's recommendation to every business manager in that room, about a little more than a third of the state, was flat fund. I think that's foolish. I did this at 2.5% on the formula, not the base. That's important to note. So, anyways, so it really doesn't net you that much. Um, I mean, what's the math there? 25 plus 5, it's $30,000. So, Again, it's not a lot. We're most likely going to receive more than $30,000 increase from the state government. They're saying suggests zero. And then basically down here, then you have your federal revenue. This is reduced because our access funds have been reduced, which is actually not a bad thing. Um, so that's Title I, Title II, Title IV, IDEA, and access. 306,000. So please note that federally, we get very, like Tony was saying, federally, what they got. I think they get they get more federally than we do, I think, because they, they, they get Perkins money. He gets almost all that just in person, which is fine. Good good for the vote check and, and positive for those students. So basically, this budget on that revenue, yes, I don't, I do have a millage increase though. I need to get the millage increase out of there now, going back to zero, no increase. 25648. So just to make sure and see if there are questions on column C. And then, you know, Tony said about the five year, I kind of, I didn't see five years out in his five year projection, but I saw five years, but they weren't five years post. Mine is then five more years. Four, one plus four is five. So then, you know, you can keep going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, sir. Yeah. I know why we hired you. Yeah. Yeah. I see <laughs> <one plus laughs> <bad>. <laughs> People don't like that. I love that. That is great. So one plus four is five. So just make sure you see all the years. And then there's some other notes in there about caps and expirations and, and some things are simply a guess. The five years out is really hard. You know, you really don't know what things are going to look like five years. But nobody does. So column C is the one you want to focus on for everybody that wants to look at the budget. And then, of course, you can get out to the expenditures. The only other thing to think about is anywhere you see select rate, beside it is a drop down. And you can make changes anywhere you see. This is the, um, I believe, Grant said about the, the small increase. This is the 5% inflation increase, which you can change if you'd like, and it will impact the budget. 
So you can play with this Excel spreadsheet as much as you'd like. And column C is the one you want to focus on. And then down at the bottom here, I do have ag program creation is below the budget. We estimated the 164 salary and program startup. I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't know. I'm um, in the solar project, the inflows and the outflows. Again, 3 million out and then 2.7 ish back in 1.7, 1.7 back in over two years. About a little less, a little more than half. So, so just to clarify a couple things. The row nine state revenue, 7,000. There are a couple of other things in there, including our FICA reimbursements. So if anybody's sitting here saying, well, wait a sec, if I make that 1.0251, it doesn't equal last year. That's why, because we will still get a little more for transportation with FICA. Yep. Um, and then also, um, oh God, totally left me. Yeah, I don't know. We'll get circle back to it in a moment. I think it's important to make sure you, we looked at expenses last night, expenditures, and it's good to just recap revenue. Uh, we have to pay for our bills somehow. And I, I appreciate what you said, Bree, about you know, adding the teacher is less about the money and more about the need, but we still have to pay for it. <laughs> so I, I appreciate both of So, anyways, let me know. And anytime you guys want to have you know, conversations about the details, let me know. Uh, if you, or walk me through something, or I tell walk you through something. I'm just more than mm. interested in counting with you. Uh, one. Yeah. Electricity. Yeah, I think I have it at fifty. You know, yeah, Forty thousand. Yeah, it, it, it might be low now that we're moving into February. But you're you're looking at March until we're online, most likely till the end of the year yeah. till we get it going. It's a so concern. We'll budget for the full amount for this upcoming year. Well, you know, you're not you're not wrong that it could be a wise idea to change cell C45. It might be. I'm just saying because it, you're not going to have it up and running by probably at the earliest, which is going to be May or June, which is going to be a month in a, one year. Well, we'll we'll drop. It'll be 100 and 150, 150 plus if we go till June. Yeah. yeah. I would say I would say put it in there for I would. But they budget. took my 25. I was all excited. Do I still have the 25 in here? Yeah. Sound system. Uh, yeah, we can, we can, well, we'll move that up to electricity. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I'm thinking you better, I would, I would say budget for the 170 okay. for the electricity because Good idea. it doesn't sound like it's going to be done in this upcoming year. Well, and the, and the, the worst case scenario is it's on early and you don't spend it and we use it, we let it, it be fun now. Is, but yeah. I'm just saying that. Okay. That's a great idea. So electricity. Yep. And then obviously you need to reduce or the capital sound system goes to zero. So. Henry, uh, you said you're advertising course sign up uh, at the start of April. Are you going to advertise ag to see how many people want to sign up for that at that time? So we're starting off with our uh, uh, elective showcase. We're doing that next week uh, on the 18th. So uh, Dr. Gunkowski is actually going to present on the ag portion of that just so we get a better feel. Uh, so yes, we will get general general numbers. For ag at that point. Yeah. How's our application? And good ones. Good. Yep. So I'm, I'm curious to see next Wednesday when we have the ag career day fair. Yes. To see what kind of response you get from that. Okay. I think it's going to draw. I think it's going to do do well. I do. Honestly, I think it's just going to continue to grow over time. Well, that's. that's that's the big thing. We we really feel it's gonna grow. Yeah, we might even start off slow, but I think it will grow. Yeah, and I know uh, all ninth grades going to this. I know the guidance counselors are going with them. They're primed to have a great day. So I think it's gonna I think it's gonna kick it off at the right time, and I think we'll I think we'll see a good response. Well, at this point, we're gonna have somewhere between 150 and 60 students preschools. That's great. Yeah. Follow-up question on electives in general. Do we have we ever had sort of a threshold of hey, if we don't have a certain number sign up, is it worth? We are now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, I know um, there were a couple classes this year. We only had one or two kids sign up for it. So I know I got on late, but I made the decision with guidance just to not run those courses. So um, again, we'll look at we'll look at the numbers. But if it's not worth running a class, you know, we gotta we gotta maximize our resources efficiently. But we'll be working through that. Yeah. We don't yeah, we don't have a specific number. It's yeah. always been 
you know, you run your you run your schedule, and then once you have drop ad, that kind of fluctuates things too. So you always know there may be a class that you know gets populated in the drop ad period. You know, it might start off small, but it will eventually. There's a lot of things to look at this year. We're yeah. just maintaining efficiency and maximizing resources. So that's that's going to be a big emphasis. Okay. I assume you do the same thing, looking whether you need to add periods. Like, hey, I might skim a few more that couldn't fit it in, but is it really worth adding another period, or do they just have to make a tough choice on whether they really pay that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Exactly. And uh, one of the things, too, I want to I wanna do, we could talk about later today, but I want to get back to uh, the homeroom for not, not having homerooms, um, think of things will run smooth and respect when we do drills and things of that sort, just so we have a, a base our kids to go to instead of just going right to first period, just 10 minute homeroom, take attendance. So, okay. thank you. So, my favorite topic always is propane. <laughs> I, honestly, I think after we finish electricity, we're just going to put propane as a line item. Um, Scott and I have an email uh, from a company, and I also emailed our current provider today um, to discuss another bid package because we'll, we'll need one. Um, in thinking about this budget, I do have some money put in here for increases to propane. Propane, in my opinion, has maintained a steady price recently and actually come down a few pennies. Uh, not much, but a little bit. So if that continues and we can lock in that rate, I could put a little bit of that money over into electricity to help not impact the budget, the full cost. Obviously, right now with the 25K, you know, we reduce it here, we put it over there. So anyways, that's something uh, I was thinking in my mind that Scott and I would be trying to nail down some conversations with the propane providers in the area to get a, you know, a better idea of what we're going to spend. Because right now, it's simply what we're spending plus, you know, an expected increase or a possible increase and then the only other concern is with propane, I think Scott can attest to this, is you know if you have really cold winters, you use more. And if you have lighter winters or milder winters, you use less. Um, so the price matters, but also the usage matters. Um, and then, of course, our, with our bid contract, we do require them to do some maintenance and safety checks. I forget all the different components that they do, but it's in the bid specs. So that's something that uh, I'm going to know that I care about. Just, I, I did email them today. I was hoping for a response quicker than I got, but that's okay. I'm going to say propane cost review, because maybe I could trim a little bit off of our expected expenditure there. Who's the supplier? Uh, copies? Copies? Uh, I would say wrong. Copies. Copies. Yeah. copies, copies, copies. They like, call the phone number, they say copies. Copies, there you they go. They call themselves copies. That's how they, yeah. They're, yeah, they've done really well for us. Um, suburban propane at one time in bid, but then that someone fell through there. And, that um, means pay that person for a while. What's that? That's good every year. Oh, uh, we we have been yes. Yeah. Last two times ago we did an 18th month window. This last time we did a 12 month. I'm I'm looking for a 12 month again. We will have to do that and advertise and go through the process. Do I have any great grand ideas on how to eliminate the propane bill? <laughs> I know we talked about like sizing the solar field and it just didn't make sense for having the cost of switching everything well, over. Thing is switching it over. So it might just be sort of stuck with it for the next 20 years until. Yeah. Boiler down and even placing. Yeah, that ain't good ideas. Well, and our hot water heaters are propane, correct? Yeah. And we we run that cost multiple times to see the difference, and then propane continues to be the more effective option. Current. Hey, um, a question for you: the, the expected increase in cost, contract, and services. Yeah. So, so that I know, is. I know we're down and we're contracting for uh, custodial services, correct? With some of the things, mm -hmm. some of the areas, because we're, we're yeah. down on, on people. That was the thirty thousand for this year. Mm -hmm. So that thirty thousand got budgeted into the contracted services. Yeah, it's going to be like what's, what line is that? Like forty? It's uh, thirty nine. Thirty nine. Sounds close. That's fine as well. He said it in sleep. I do see this in my sleep. Uh, yeah, so I took it out to 7,500. That includes a slight increase in um, 3B. Now, and we're, and don't forget, we're transitioning some dollars, right? So we're not hiring custodian on our staff, we're hiring on their staff. So it's in the budget. It's just being coded contracted services versus payroll. 
beauty there is we don't pay FICA, we don't pay teasers. That station 48% right there. But um, also with the NRG quote, what that Mr. Davis is not, there was that piece we were missing. Uh, remember the two days or something? Yeah. So that's what that is. That gets me to the energy quote that I want to do to all of our services. Oh. So the increase in the 30,000, is what I'm getting at, the 30,000 increase this year was only a one-time thing? Yeah, it, it's it's flushed out, yes, because it's, it's, it's in there. Because contracted enough. services are going up by 5%. Yep. There. Right. So you're not going to keep paying that extra 30 grand. It's built in. I know, but I'm what I'm saying is, if you're not building I didn't, it in because it would be $60,000. If you're saying take if these you put, two together and yeah, add then 5%. Yeah. I don't think we're going to see a 5% increase amongst all of our contracted services because most of these companies aren't raising the prices. We've already set the threshold. You don't need the 5%. I'm I'm giving, so it's the 5% on the old number, not the total. All right, that's where I was just yeah. concerned. It's not you. a mistake in the concept of, I, I don't think we, I don't want to over pad that budget. Okay, that's I'll fine. I just wanted to make sure that we were, yeah. Rocking. So I see what you're saying. I could take 723,000 multiplied by 0.05, 1.05. I don't need to do that. This plus this should be about 13,000, roughly, um, is plenty. Right. Yeah. But that's a good catch. That's a good catch. I guess you're right. So sometimes B and C don't always align, especially like if you're thinking down below in the capital projects. I guess I did a good job of aligning them, but they don't have to align. For instance, this is a good one, right? The 23-24, this is classroom technology, and this is targeted technology. Still technology, but they're different types of technology. So like, I don't know how to show them. I don't want to keep adding lines. So that's why I've noticed 20, column B is classroom technology. This is all the smart, these things. Yeah, what's right. the targeted tech? I really feel like we're going to need a couple cameras, targeted technology. So a couple things here, a couple things that's, there. That's separate from the security improvement line in there? Yeah, okay. I think the security's going to be more physical. All right, we can talk about that. Exactly. Yes, yes, of course. That's fine. Yes. We, we have some needs with some security. Yeah. You yeah, need sure. to either not discuss any of that. Of course. Oh, you need Zach Votech increase in yeah. there versus just the 5%. Correct, Correct. it's 2.3%. Yeah. And I think if I noticed that their athletics was 2.3, and we're running under 2, so I was pleased about that. We're more efficient with our athletics than other budgets I've seen. So. But yes, that should be the uh, 931 or something like that. 930 something. Whatever Tony presented to us. Uh, which one is it? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, 932, 476 should have been what he presented to us tonight. Which is not 5% of the 900,000. Now, I have a 5% going out years because that's what the trend has been. And notice they dipped into their fund balance, which, which I appreciate. They've been trying to level out their fund balance. Yeah, yeah it was too high. Kind of it down. Yeah. Well, and that helps us. It helps all districts by them using some of their fund balance. Yeah, so 932, I think, was the amount on. Yeah, it was. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> yep, 932, perfect. Yep. But always check me. Hey, I would rather you guys tell me, hey, Chris, C-17 has an error. And if it does, let me know. Now, this is our spreadsheet. Okay, this is, please don't. This is our spreadsheet. <laughs> we will We're change it if you guys want. Do we, do we still have a payment to on the loan for? Okay. Yes, it should be the fifth column. Uh, when you click on the, it should be five numbers. They're not five numbers. So you're talking about bonds? So bonds right here. Okay, so it's fixed in with the bonds. One, two, three, four, it's five. Okay. And then if you click on the principal, so it's 2016, uh, 2017 A and B in 2019, and then the 108, 108,000 is the bond principal for the boat, Columbia Monterey Road Tech loan for 24, 25. Okay, I want to make sure. In a couple years yeah, past, it was its own row leading I, up to the one yeah, that was there. It's now considered there. debt. Yep. So, yep, so there should be five numbers in the interest and five numbers in the principal. Now, we do refinance, you're going to see that's going to have to shift. But that's how it is now. And that, is that a fixed rate loan? Mm -hmm. No, it's adjusted. Anyway, As caps, it's um, cap. it's a five year cap. And we're at it's like 0 0.08 right yeah. now, I think. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 Well, fine. Yeah. Well, okay. Yes, yeah, so we have some time. We have some time until we have to make decisions there.
<laughs> and we did already earn back interest um, our entire funding cost of the Columbia Library Tech Project, which is forty-three thousand. We have paid for that in interest, which is wonderful. Yeah, together with the time. All right. okay. Yeah, the yeah, we have about three hundred thousand left. Tony said seventy-five percent, and he he was it's right about there. Um, we have three hundred some thousand left that we're still holding to disperse. Yeah, so true. Mr. Davis, are there any public comments? This is Majeski. There are no online comments. Did you want anything from us for this, or are we just it's just not looking not at it still? Just I think you guys need to digest it, and then yeah, we, we go in April. Oh, no, we need, so in April, I'm going to give you the national uh, bids. Uh, you know, I mean. I'm assuming 6.9 is out, but we should probably run it anyways. Uh, I like right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, one, one thing also to keep in mind is the ag and then the possible elementary teacher funding. There are numbers that are possible. Right. You know, in the next month, hopefully, we'll be able to have it narrowed down to say yes, it would be adding or no. Right. And when we talk about retirements affecting the number, it's not because we we may have to replace that teacher. It's just typically it's someone who has not cost as much. And we'll have other ideas from if we have to replace those with scheduling being done. Right. With, the next month. with all of that changes, so yeah, uncertainty so, around. There's too much uncertainty to be able to do anything. The other key takeaway here is the vast majority of the expenses are salaries and wages and benefits, you know, salaries and benefits actually are 2.8 percent or 2.7 percent. What? They go up, the average the benefits and salaries goes up, or yeah. salaries go up 2.7 percent every year. That's that's a blended average. Nothing but it's actually a blended out. average between the teachers and the admin because they're not all in the, you know. Nothing that can be done about it now. The contracts were hard fought and well negotiated um, to get to that. Um, the amount that we have to play with is very small expense side at this point. We've I, I welcome your new eyes, yeah. both of you, looking at it and seeing if there's something that we missed. But I mean, the amount of time that we've if you looked at both bang, bang, Jim's head against the wall trying to find new stuff to fall out of here and lost all my hair. <laughs> 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 yeah, wasn't it? Did Botex say eighty percent? Eighty percent? Yeah. 80 percent benefits and salaries yeah well then there may, maybe there is somewhere else that we could well, aren't we lower than 80 percent or lower what i mean oh oh, oh. so if, if their budget is 80 if 80 percent of their budget is I wages know and how benefits can... that means only 20 percent is the okay. thing right i wonder how they get away with two percent utility costs i want to ask tony about that they, that's what this it's budget was two percent utility we spend, we have bigger buildings, I guess. That's probably what it is. I mean, we we previously renegotiated health insurance. We renegotiated the busing contracts. There's, I mean, and in, in the health insurance is capped. Like, the increase there is, is capped at 108, or at 8%, I mean, um, 2026, until the end of 26. Um, and then you can see here in, in Chris's projections, it jumps. But then 15, 18, 22 percent increase, and those are real. Those are and those are low. real. These, they're so low. Yeah, those are low estimates of what those increases look like, and we would be seeing well in excess of eight percent now had we not negotiated the caps in at the time with that change. Um, and we'll get a we'll get uh, what's the name of that company? BSI. BSI. Yeah, we'll get a an estimated of use and all that information towards. Probably what made you somewhere there before that. I mean, was there any consultants? They they'll they yeah, must talk to everybody and tell us what's going on. Yeah, um, what the I, I guarantee we're going to get eight percent. But on the other hand, you know, I think that first year we didn't get a full eight percent. No, we there's five and a half. Yeah. yeah, we did well. So we, it depends on usage of everything and how much was paid in and all that stuff. And BSI comes and sits down with us and says this is what it looks like and this is what it's going to be when we didn't when we went with geisinger we were looking at i think 27 20 it was 25, over, it was over 25 percent increase, increase. with the other plan that we were with and that was 
bringing it down. They wanted, I think, a 30, 34 or 33% increase. They brought it down and we renegotiated the 25. And then that's when Geisinger came into the mix. And for Geisinger to go out, I think we went, what, it went out five years? Yeah. Five yeah, years to go with the cap of 1.08 or 8%. And that BSI exactly. even said that's unheard of. Like, never. So we got the, the five year caps. And also there was a significant reduction in first year premium versus what we were looking at even without the other increase. Like it was it was a reduction. That was my question in the interview. Yeah. I said, How did you do that? Yeah. You guys so the negotiation? I mean we saved on, on a, uh, over a two year period on the order of two and a half million dollars just in health insurance. And um, if you look at that if you extended it out way point six, then it ended up being you know, probably five. It, it was dramatic. Um the same thing with Fullington. Um, that that contract was renegotiated and significantly significantly reduced. Um, and then both the teachers contract and the uh, AFSCME contract for everybody else who uh, bargaining unit. Both of those were renegotiated. Re so the expenses are tight, <laughs> but shake it and see what you can find. But I. Well, I do have the fuel. The fuel surcharge has kicked in, um, so I have that in there. It's built in fully. I don't know if we're going to hit the fuel surcharge max this year. They just started charging us fuel surcharge, so we'll see. We'll see. That's that's on track. Right. Thanks. Will you let us know when we're offline, Mr. Davis? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Early night for him. Your, I think this does it. You know.